I, I have the time now um, at 3.02, uh, so I'm going to open a working group session on um, House or Senate Bill 458 and 459. Um, if, if there are no objections, um, since neither of these have a, a more precise time associated with them, I'd like to flip them and start talking about 459 first. And the reason for that is I know that uh, Mr. Ribsom is trying to get over here so he can participate in the 458 discussion. So um, is there any objection for us starting with 459? Uh, okay. The, um, and and I, I, I want to ap apologize. Uh, an old military thing was you were supposed to give uh, people the maximum amount of time you can to get prepared so that they can get themselves ready for whatever you're about to do next. And, um, and so just yesterday is, is when uh, the House voted out on 4, 458 and 459. Here we are basically 24 hours later beginning to talk about it. The bills that got assigned to Division Three, I think, are generally kind of complicated. Um, there's like 430, I think, that we have to deal with uh, next week. That's got the 23 line items in it, for example. So uh, there just wasn't a lot of available time, and I wanted to get the ball rolling. And and these two struck me as two that could potentially um, end up with an amendment. And so the sooner that we talked about the, the, the possibility or the potential need for an amendment, it just seemed it would be better because then all parties could kind of get themselves ready and get their uh, ideas uh, organized. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get us started on uh, 459. Uh, this is uh, relative to health care facility workplace violence program. This, this was amended yesterday. Uh, by the House, um, it looks to me like the copy we have is the correct version because I, I don't see anything in here on the warrantless arrest section, and that was the part that I understand to have been um, uh, deleted from the bill. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to open the floor to, um, to any representative that has comments or thoughts that they want to share with us about 459. I have, I have a lot of ideas on it that I'd like to talk to you about, so I, I won't be shy there. Uh, I, I know that uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, pro I'm probably going to ask um, Mr. Thomas to, to, to come to the microphone at some point to talk with us, but do, do you know, uh, Pat, or do, Sharon, do you you all want to say anything about 459? You probably voted for it yesterday, and so you just generally like it. On on a, on how about on a scale of zero to ten, how how well do you know what's in this bill? Have you had a chance to analyze it at all? Six. I, I read it thoroughly before yesterday because I had a constituent reach out to me, um, who didn't like the warrantless arrest, and so I read the whole thing, including what we deleted but I had not focused on it. In fact, I didn't know we were considering it today till I arrived today. I thought we were only doing the Sununu bill, which I don't object. I'm just saying it was a surprise to me, so I had not done prep work other than reading it before we voted on it. Yeah, and I've, I've uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've, uh, I've read it a couple times uh, yesterday on the floor and today when I knew I was gonna be sitting here. Um, and I, I'm open. I'm, I'm, comfortable with it i did vote for it i'm i'm open for whatever okay my, my point in asking the question isn't to put anyone on the spot or embarrass anyone it's just that i know that this is a much more rapid process than normal and therefore you haven't been afforded the amount of time that would be appropriate to really prepare so um so i just wanted to know you know kind of where we were Rep representative norgren have you had a chance to get dirty in this thing? Well, no, I read the bill last night, so I'm fine. All right, very good. Representative Bean? Yes, uh, I was looking at page one here, lines 10 and 11, 
where it's, uh, it talks about uh, intimidation, threatening behavior, verbal abuse, without regard to whether the victim sustains an injury, psychological trauma, or stress. I'm, uh, I'm kind of big, and I'm a little loud because I'm hard of hearing. And some people are really, really, really easily intimidated. Um, I was just having a, a conference with a, with a person that, uh, about something completely other than this. And she, was, uh, she went to the police station <laughs> and said that, uh, that I was, I don't know, she said something. that She was intimidated. She was in, in fear of physical harm. And I was just talking to her. And so this, this language here, it's, it's kind of vague for me. So, so can we uh, postpone just for a few minutes the further discussion on that? Okay. I, I, I see your point. I'm, right now I'm just trying to get a headset on where we all are. It sounds like you're prepared to get into the, bot, the body of the bill which is kind of what I'm looking for. And uh, Representative Weiler, you're, you're always prepared, I know, but, but, uh, I'm fine. okay. All right. So, Mr. Um, Chairman, yes, I just have a question. Um, are we supposed to be doing the policy on this bill? I mean, I thought the policy committee did the policy and we're here to consider the financial side of it. And I'm just concerned that we may be going beyond the scope of what traditionally is finances work. I'd, I'd say I'd hang, I'd ask you to hang on to your, uh, your point because we haven't actually started yet no i you have every reason to be suspicious of me uh, but but it's just a little it's just a little early i we I, we haven't gone there yet it wasn't your comments it was representative yeah, that yeah. brought my, my yeah. that made my antenna go up oh, okay all right um all right so um so my general observations of the bill uh, to tie it immediately to the, the financial aspect is that uh, uh, we would end up, the fiscal note says that the state would have to add a couple of people, uh, one to New Hampshire Hospital, uh, one to Glencliff. Uh, we're, we're on the verge of opening up Hampstead, so I, I just think that would probably be a third person. And so w within our own state, owned hospital system we're we're adding manpower we're adding workload uh and so so there is cost to the state system as a result of this bill and and then one can project if if that's what it's going to take at the uh at the state hospital level that uh, throughout the state uh, others may also end up incurring some additional cost so um so i do think this is kind of a legitimate issue for us, uh, particularly since our, the manpower is tied to the mandate of having this commission and having people participate in the mandate of the reports that would be required. Um, this is creating a workload uh, for, for organizations throughout the state and specifically uh, state-owned hospitals. So I, my, my first reaction to it is the mandates cost money. And what I have been told with, with, with I think, some passion from people representing uh, various uh, uh, interests within the state healthcare system, that after five years of trying to get a bill like this, there's tremendous alignment about doing this bill now, that they want this bill. Okay, so, so just so you know, in my way of viewing the world, if, if organizations want to do something, you don't need to mandate that they do it. And so two, two things cannot be true simultaneously to me. You, you, you can't have everyone wanting to do it and then also have to mandate it. Those two are just logically in conflict with me. So I, so I, one of the things I would want to do with this bill is to go through it and, and write it in such a way in which the state is endorsing the premise of the commission and the premise of the reports and setting up some structure for voluntary compliance 
in allowing a voluntary effort to organize around this bill over the next couple, three years and find out if that's going to be adequate to the task before we have to use state coercion to get it done. That, that's where I'm coming from. And so with that, uh, Representative Weiler, do you have a comment? You're talking about one person in each hospital. And I don't think there's going to be that many times that these uh, new rules are going to be put in force. So I think if you had one person that was on the phone that could go and visit each of these places that there might have been and, and investigate each complaint to see if it complied with this new legislation, then if that person was swamped, then they might say, okay, we need someone specifically just there. These things are happening so often. But to just put three new people on board right away, I don't think it's called for. Thank you. Uh, if, I, if I could just uh, comment on that. I think I, my understanding of the one FTE for each of our hospitals is derived from the fact that each facility under the bill would be mandated to provide uh, development of policies and procedures that they would have to provide appropriate tra training and education to all employees upon new hire and once a year thereafter just like the annual training that we used, we got used to um, and that uh, uh, and then it starts to get very prescriptive about what constitutes appropriate education and training so this is a very uh, into the weeds mandated program that would drive some of the FTE still it's a it's a full-time job for one person at its inception yeah. once people get educated as to what to be looking for and they get phone calls about hey you need to investigate this then the person could come and see what the workload actually might amount to that's my point thanks yes, yes sir uh, 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 thank you for joining us I know you had a drive so I appreciate it um, Okay, so, so I think it would be fair to ask our Representative Nordgren, Long, or Walls, do, do you have any response to, to my observation that making this mandatory drives FTEs in our own state budget and throughout the state and that maybe we ought to be looking at making this a voluntary program instead of a mandatory program? Do you have any observations or thoughts on that? Again, I don't want to put you on the spot because this is also willy-nilly. So, if I may, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, I uh, I don't have any objection going through that. I, I sense where you're coming from and I'm willing to take a look at that. Uh, with respect to rehabilitation, do you think there's any county nursing home uh, arms, this and that arm also, or just the let, two you mentioned? Let, let, me, let me answer the question I think you're asking. Who, who's affected by this law? It's, I think it's all of the hospitals within the state and all of the uh, urgent care centers. So there's a lot of health facilities that are not included in this bill, such as nursing homes and ambulatory surgical centers. Those are two that I know of. So, so this is a, a partial envelopment of a subset of our health care system. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Nordgren. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think we need to be careful if we're if we're looking to change the number that's been suggested by this bill, as Representative Weiler was thinking, I mean, I think we don't want to be, oh, pardon me. I'm feeling very short in this chair, too. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so I think um, I'm concerned that we keep looking back at what the body of the um, bill does um, starting, you know, in section one. I think we need to be sure we're not interfering with what the policy committee has already deemed necessary in their mind when we're trying to balance how many people we're doing so we can make sure that we're complying with 
what the policy has already sort of been set by the policy committee. I, I think I think that's fair and, and to try to explain what I what I think I'm doing here or at least suggesting is that the fiscal issue is really connected to the manpower. The manpower is really driven by the state providing a mandate. And and if we are to change the mandate so that it's um, in, instead of a shall, it all becomes, or most of it becomes a may, then we are not mandating their expense. Given that the that so many interest groups in the state have, have stepped forward to say they want this program, it, it doesn't seem to me that we have to mandate it in order to get this commission started and get the reporting started all on a voluntary basis without the state mandate. So y yes, Representative Norgren. No, I would just go back to the point then that we have to make sure that that theory doesn't interfere with the sections of the bill that the policy committee deemed necessary when they passed the bill to us. So, you know, whether or not it's okay to do what you're suggesting with the body of the bill still standing the way the policy committee meant it to be. I, I okay, I, I hear you and I, I to tell you what I've done so far is I, I took this document, I put it into a Word document, and I started going through it line by line, and I looked for every place where it said shall and, and tried to delete shall and put a may in there to see if it still worked. And uh, with, with, with some basic modification or tweaking, I think the framework of what the policy committee says is necessary to have a, an effective program can remain. It just, instead of becoming a, a, a coercive effort by the state, it, it's allowed to become a voluntary compliance effort by the citizens of the state with the state having provided some overall guidance and vision of what they're trying to accomplish. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if I look on the first page, line 16, it said the program shall consider the size, and then there's another shell at the end of the line. Um, are we interfering with that and making that a may? I guess. So, so the word interfere, I I, I wouldn't use that. Okay. I, I would say that yeah. that in the version that I've got on my computer that you don't see, yeah. uh, I I swapped the word may for both of those shalls. And, and then in order to make it the English semantics work, I started to, you know, uh, modify how the bullets underneath it started out just so it was, still was English. But, but I think it works with mays instead of shalls. Yes. But, but it might not work with the policies committee's decision on why they passed the bill like this to us. Is what I'm saying. That what, what, what I'm saying, though, is... We can refuse the policy committee's demand in this bill for it to be mandatory so that we can avoid the cost to the state and the unfunded mandate on the civilian people or the civilian health care institutions of the state. I, th I, think, I think we can protect the policy by rendering it voluntary and endorsing it with the vote of the legislature and the signature of the governor without having to use coercion. Uh, Representative Weiler. I don't think it's any different than any other steps we've taken in any of the other bills that come to us. Either we find the money by saying, okay, we might have to put it in next time's budget, we might have to put it in only half this budget, we might have to put it in six months of this budget, we might have to reduce the number, I don't think we're changing the policy. We're adjusting the revenue to, or the, the available revenue to match what has been suggested. That's always been our goal. And so that what the steps we're talking about, I think fit with the role, the role we've always done, trying to make the money match 
the policies that we're seeing new. I think it works. R Representative Walsh. Um, I, I think if you're talking about state money right now, realistic, I mean, we're sitting on $250 million surplus. Clearly, we've got the money right now, and we don't know what's coming in the future. I mean, we all know that. Um, but in terms of the private, uh, in a mandate on the private sector, um, I, I, as I'm reading through this and, and trying to find the shells that you found, I think some should not be replaced. Some of the reporting requirements and things like that, if you, if you take the shell and make it in May, you've gutted the bill. And it's not for financial reasons that you're gutting the bill. And I think we've got to be very careful going through and changing that language. Uh, I'm also, you also started with an assumption that this is one full-time employee for each facility. I'm not convinced it is. I think the first few months of this are a little onerous, but you could have somebody like a director of HR be doing this kind of stuff or somebody in the HR department do a lot of this kind of stuff in terms of the policy. And I think that it's erroneous to assume that we are imposing the cost of one full-time employee on every facility here uh, to do this. So, 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 so to just that point, I'm, I'm quoting the LBA whose methodology ends up with a sentence, and I quote, to, to total combined costs for the two facilities will therefore be $272,000 per year. There's no reference to it'll be X for the first three months and then it'll go away. It's, it says it's 272 per year and they counted on two facilities. We happen to know that there's a third facility that's likely to come online, Hampstead. So if it's if these two hospitals need it, then I, I it's a fairly reasonable assumption that the the third would as well. Right, but I preface my comments by saying what we're talking about. My comments specifically refer to private facilities. So I'm thinking of some of the smaller hospitals, like maybe up in Berlin, that may not need one full-time employee to do this and may be able to incorporate into HR. Um, and so I agree on the state, it's very clear what the fiscal note says, but that's why I preface my comments with respect to the private sector, that this is not necessarily a cram down of one full-time employee on every private sector facility. Um, so that, that's one of the thoughts I had. My other concern is, is by making this more voluntary, um, we have seen some of the hospitals in this state get in financial trouble. We just saw Laconia, which got bought by Concord because they were in way underwater financially. If we make this not mandatory, are we then, th that would likely be one of the first things that some hospital cuts if they're in financial trouble. And, and I ask this as a real question, are we then setting up a situation where we're endangering the employees? Because if it's not mandatory, the hospitals aren't necessarily gonna follow all this. And, and I just think it's something that we need to consider along the way is, you know, the purpose of this is to protect employees. So by making this all voluntary, are we then gutting the ultimate purpose of this, and that is protecting the employees from the dangers that are out there? I, I, I think that's a fair question. Uh, I, 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 I think you exposed sort of a, a kind of a double-edged sword there that um, we do have hospitals that are uh, at financial risk and that this would represent some cost. It's not zero. They can't do this for free. So we're throwing another mandate on a financially distressed institution potentially, and that may be the straw that breaks their back. I doubt it, but you know it, it, that that's sort of the the way I tie those two thoughts together. Is if they're financially troubled institutions out there, we shouldn't be imposing more mandates. That 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 that's how I look at it. But I would just ask then, at what cost? At what cost to the safety of the employees? Oh, okay, so I. I spent 43 years in healthcare, and uh, I have never run into a healthcare administrator that didn't care deeply about uh, the productivity and safety of the nursing staff and other staff operating within the hospital. I, 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 don't, I don't think this is an area where we are dealing with management that is uh, unwilling to, to do the smart things to take care of their workforce, particularly when nursing staff and other members of uh, the workforce are so scarce. If, if anything, 
This is when employee employers would go the extra mile. And, and if they're hearing from their, their nursing staff, I keep saying nursing staff because uh, the lobbyists for the nursing association spent a bunch of time with me, so I'm reacting to that feedback. If, if the nursing staff is, is concerned about this and they can point to a law saying, hey, you know, the, the state really thinks it'd be a great idea for us to have this local workplace violence program, I, it just seems to me that this stuff would come together voluntarily and, and wouldn't have to be mandatory. And, uh, and if it is true that, that the state has struggled with this for five years to try to get something like this together, I think the fact that we would take a step forward with some sort of a law to institute this or to uh, recognize and honor the principles of managing workforce violence, that 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 again the the voluntary nature of our citizenry would kick in and solve the problem and if it doesn't we can come back in two or three years i i would love to believe that um workplaces are as caring about their employees as you think but less than two weeks ago i had a lengthy conversation with a nurse who for about 20 years worked up at dartmouth hitchcock and it didn't make my papers where I live, but apparently in the last couple of years, they've had two nurses strangled up at Dartmouth Hitchcock, neither of which were killed, but one of which was disabled. They literally snapped the, the guy snapped the vertebrae in her neck. And right. And the other one was not as badly injured, but was quite significantly injured. They did bring somebody in and there's now a uh, off law officer in the ER room up at Dartmouth Hitchcock because of that. But they do not impose enough safety precautions up there and this nurse that had worked there for 20 years is now working at concord hospital because she didn't feel safe up at dartmouth hitchcock and this is in the middle of COVID. she's she's been at, at concord less than six months and it's because dartmouth isn't following through with enough safety precautions and you're right they're losing staff and they're short staffed up there they couldn't afford to lose her at all but they did so i i'm just saying that even with two attempted murders up there with two serious strangulations up there she felt that they still were not protecting their employees and with that in the back of my head i'm a little more reluctant to make this voluntary Hearing, I mean, that firsthand story, I'm serious, it was less than two weeks ago that she spent a long time telling me this story. And, you know, those, I know it's anecdotal, but those things stick with you. So implicit in your, in this, in this tragic story, and it's horrifying, but uh, is the idea that if a stand, if the state mandates a reporting system, that that will stop violence. I, I, I don't I don't know that there's a, a logical connection to mandating a reporting process and actually affecting directly affecting the behavior of ne'er do wells that would go out and violently attack a person. I, I, I think that level of violence exists whether or not we're reporting on it, frankly. But I, I agree with you. But I think whether or not the hospital has additional staff to help protect its employees is what this is all about. And, and I agree, the narrative wells are gonna do what they're gonna do regardless. The question is, what kind of protection, what kind of um, procedures are in the hospital to try and limit their ability to reach anybody and to hurt them? Oh, all right, thank you. Uh, Representative Weiler. I wonder if there's anybody here that was prevalent at the hearings in the policy committees, perhaps the senator, to hear if there was any um, explanation of how really prevalent this is, whether there's, you know, one time that's, yeah, if somebody gets tried to get strangled, that's going to be talked about forever, whether it's three, four years ago or whatever. But, you know, if, if this is not something that's happening frequently, it seems like it's overkill. Thank you. That, that was an invitation if you'd like to accept it, Representative Daniels. All right, you were not on that policy committee. You're, you're here really for 458 when we get to it, right? Is that correct? Yeah. All right, so I would invite either or both or all of the lobbyists to, to speak to any of the things that you've heard in the last 20 minutes. Good afternoon, Paula Minahan um, for the Hospital Association. And 
I, I was at the hearing, so I can answer that question. Hi, Sean Thomas with the MERS and Praise Hall. We represent the New Hampshire Nurses Association. Sean Thomas. Thank you. Swoop and SH, right? S H A W A U S H A U N. The third option. S H A U N. U N. Yeah. The third option, he said. So go ahead. So I, uh, I think it was Representative Weiler asked the question relative to the prevalence of these incidences. And while um, some make the press, on, unfortunately, um, a lot of them do not. There was a security um, specialist that works at Catholic Medical Center, John Patty, who is um, works there now, but and is in charge of security, was um, on the on the Manchester Police Department for years. He's retired. Um, chief, I believe, and he indicated for 13 hospitals that did report um, to us through the hospital association, there were approximately, I think, 600 um, incidences in the last year um, or so. Wow. I it actually it happens unfortunately more frequently than any of us would like to um, believe, and they representative certainly by. Um, you know, there are those that, um, right. you know, um, end up um, disabled, um, as, and then there are those that are, um, you know, punched that um, do not go out on workers' comp, for instance. So there's a whole variety. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. If, if I, 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 I would add to that that my own daughter works as an LNA at the Elliott and at Parkland, and she treats uh, um, geriatric dementia patients. And she she frequently is attacked by the patients themselves. So so I have absolutely no doubt that this is a very real uh, problem. So so Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, I, just to add to that as well. Uh, so the Nurses Association, along with others, completed a pilot study at the end of last year, uh, and some pretty good. Specific Pacific to Merrimack County. 37% of uh, nurses within the previous six months had experienced physical aggression. 73% uh, had experienced some form of violent incident. That's not further defined here, but um, something less, obviously, than physical aggression. And, you know, in this, this study also points back to studies that have been completed previously. One of those, and this goes, obviously, several years back i think the study was completed back between 2011 to 2013 but that study looked at a national 24,000 workplace assaults nationally and 75 percent of those occur in healthcare settings so healthcare workers are far more likely to be victims of workplace safety incidents or violence violence incidents um, than in other workplaces and I, and I will and I'll say to that as well, obviously, they're in a unique situation, too, because when they are subject to this violence. To the person who likely caused them harm. And can I also say, um, I, I don't know if everyone knows the genesis of this bill, but this was um, many years in the making. It was actually a bill um, that result that was requested um, by the Nurses Association, Hospital Association, and a number of other organizations in 2019 um, to create a commission. But two in 2019, 2020, of course, in March of 2020, everything is shut down. So this was a victim, that bill was a victim of the... Um, of the shutdown and, and of the pandemic. So then in um, we asked Senator Gray to resubmit that legislation, which he did in, 20, in the fall of 2020. So in 2021, the commission was actually, after um, committee of conference, turned into a study committee, which met all fall and into the winter of this past um, 2021 into 2022. And Green 
Green and Litchfield all sat on that study committee and Senator um, Sherman participated in every single one of those that resulted in the legislation that you see today. That did include the warrantless arrests um, that I know has been taken, um, removed from the legislation. But the study committee, um, and I actually, sorry, I meant to bring you the report, um, but I can get that report. It shows, I think they met seven or eight times. Um, and uh, there was a very um, thoughtful and, and um, thorough discussion by all stakeholders, including the uh, um, ACLU, DRC, NAMI, um, us um, here present today, the um, Home Care Association, Health Care Association, et cetera. Every, and that's how we ended up in care and hospitals participate. There are different reasons, um, and I think someone asked about um, the, the health care association or, or counties. Um, the, the nursing homes have to do their own reporting, so it was determined that they already report um, in a, through CMS, um, Centers of Medicaid and Medicaid Ser Medicare and Medicaid Services, they have to report certain um, incidences, so they, they determined that that was um, appropriate. This is a request of the stakeholders. We are, we're asking um, for this help. We're asking for the state to um, and the legislature to put this in place so that we have uniformity. I mentioned the 600 incidences of 13 hospitals. Um, we only had 13 hospitals report for various reasons. It was not, it's not a mandate. It was a request um, and um, they do have um, workplace um, violence prevention programs, but they vary um, and they, they do have DS escalation, but they vary. We're looking for uniformities to ensure that um, we can have a um, good database to allow for a, a confidential discussion of these incidences to lead to best practices and hopefully um, improvement in the entire system. So again, we are um, we are requesting that the state we need we need your help. We want this to be um, a requirement um, because we want uniformity, we want um, inclusivity, and we want to protect our health care workers. Um, and we believe that this is, I be, this is one of the highest priority bills for the hospital association, and I believe it is also for the nurses association. Um, and I am happy to answer any other questions. But honestly, every single um, section of this bill was, was um, discussed and debated in subcommittees and then full study committee. And um, the commission is mirrored exactly after the quality commission that has been in place that you authorized 17 years ago. That is now um, a permanent commission. It was um, initially not a permanent commission, but it got reauthorized every five years. And um, the last um, time it was um, made permanent, um, Senator Rosenwald sponsored that bill a couple years ago. Um, and the protection, the confidentiality is to ensure that there is, um, uh, everyone is, um, that there's no discovery of the information um, discussed at the commission level. Right now, that commission is um, voluntarily staffed, um, and we are 100% um, funding through the Hospital Association and the Foundation for Healthy Communities, the Quality Commission. Um, it was, um, we do not, um, we are not able to do that with this commission, and um, and the Department of HHS um, is not, um, 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 concerned with being responsible for um, organizing the commission, but it'll be staffed obviously by every member of um, the hospital. Each hospital will have a member participating, likely the security officer or someone responsible for security, which is different than the quality commission. So uh, go ahead, Representative Weiler. If the proposal to make this voluntary rather than mandatory. Would you find that problematic? I do believe that that would be concerning because we need to have um, the um, the weight, I guess, of the le the authority and the weight of the legislature to require that we have un again everyone is reporting in a uniform way. So I do have concerns about making it voluntary. I do. Thank you. So, so that, is that why there are fines in here, two thousand dollars, if uh, if they don't comply? Yeah, that, that that's certainly part of the reason. I mean, if if I 
I don't mean to interrupt representative. If I just, if I may respond to representative Weiler's question as well. Um, so we too think it would be problematic. The concern is if this is voluntary, then we basically maintain the status quo and we don't, we don't take any steps forward. It guts the bill. Um, I think if I understand, I understand the reasoning or the, the argument that to the extent the hospitals and the urgent cares want to do this, then why don't they do it? Um, I, I, I guess I would say to that, if even one decided not to participate, there's less incentive for the others to participate because what you get out of this in the end is an additional, in addition to standardized data, complete data. And that is what is useful when, you know, taking learning and share, sharing that information, learning from that information, uh, and incorporating the best practices you learn from that shared information, bringing that back to your hospital or to your urgent care and improving your internal policies um, that enhance the safety of our healthcare workers. So uh, that tr just triggers like four different thoughts in my head. So thank you for that. Um, one, um, the primary reason that this program is needed, as I understand it, is because employees are asking their employers to do it and that the employees are operating under some threat and some duress. And so therefore, the employers should be predisposed to providing them with safety and security in the workforce. I, I, I think that, at the end of the day, is the primary reason that hospitals should want to do this. Am I mistaken there? Uh, and I'll, I'll let Paula add to this as well, but I think hospitals do already address it to your point. I think what this seeks to address is, is something beyond what is already being provided. This is an opportunity for the hospitals, all the hospitals in the state, the urgent cares, to get together and to confidentially freely and openly discuss incidents that are occurring in each of their facilities so that they may learn from those incidents and take that information back to their own facilities and improve the processes currently in place. So I want to pick at the word opportunity. The opportunity for every hospital to do that is there today. What, what we're not seeking is opportunity for them to participate. What we're doing is we're trying to create a mandate that is uh, uh, pun punishable by fine for not complying with uh, with a state law. Th th this isn't about opportunity. This is about uh, coercion, right? Well, well, I, I don't think the opportunity exists today. And the, I mean, the reason these hospitals these hospitals won't get together because currently you wouldn't go to another hospital and discuss these incidents um, without this without the confidentiality provisions included in this bill, and you also it's this data, the sharing of information is less useful to the extent it isn't standardized in, in a common reporting standardized format. So, so, I think so if we offered standardization, though, if we offered standardization, then it could be done in a standardized way. And the standardization doesn't need to be mandatory. That can be suggestive. But HL7, for example, the way in which we uh, manage uh, IT transactions in healthcare, that's not a mandatory standard. It's a standard that people all voluntarily use. I, so uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know that we need to mandate something in order to standardize the information reporting. But if voluntary, you only standardize the information with respect to the participating hospitals. You don't standardize the information across the board. And we see this similar to the infection um, reporting that the hospitals must do, that the state um, does. So we we honestly see this as um, building upon those types of programs that already exist. So we don't see it as a mandate. We see it as a supporting um, legislation that we need. We are asking the legislature to support our healthcare um, workers to ensure again that we have the ability to report uniformly and have the commission 
um, set up so that we, they can have that confidential, safe environment to have those discussions exactly like what goes on in the Quality Commission um, so that they're not discoverable. Um, I, I don't remember how the, um, how the fine um, uh, section got in there, to be honest, but it's, um, we, we do not have a problem with it per se, um, but I don't recall how that got in there. Um, I think it just all kind of, it, again, this was a, a comprehensive stakeholder input, and we are looking to ensure that we do have 100% participation. And again, the urgent care centers, we don't represent them. Hospitals do have them, but um, we, they, they, wanted to be part of this as well, um, led by um, Dr. Punt from Convenient MD, but he also spoke with Clear Choice MD, which are two independent for-profit um, entities um, th that I think you know are throughout the state, um, that um, they want to be part of this as well. So I think it sends a very strong message from the state of New Hampshire that they care about um, their healthcare workforce, and um, this is this is what they they believe is important to ensure they that the nurses and the healthcare um, workers feel like they will be um, heard. There will be a reporting process. Their information will be protected. Um, and that something actually will happen um, because we don't have the ability to sit around the table now. We don't. I know you and I have had this conversation, um, and but we're not protected. They can't. They are not protected now. Um, there, and I can get you um, the genesis of why we put that um, language in the confidentiality in the healthcare quality. Let, and let's hold off on confidentiality okay. just okay. a second because sure. we've got exposed for a moment. The idea that there's a two thousand dollar fine here for not com not no compliance. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, would the hospital association or the nursing association be okay if we struck the two thousand dollar fine for failure to comply with this new state law? S speaking for the nurses association, we would be okay with striking that language. I think that is a good alternative to making the entire bill voluntary. We at the hospital association um, would echo what the nurses association indicated. Um, we are okay with um, striking it. We do, did not take a position on that. We support the entire bill. Um, we believe all of it kind of fits together. Um, and, you know, we're, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. And then, and back to the, the notion, it's been stated here a couple of times that you need 100% of the information in order to have any useful information, or words to that effect. When I took statistics a long time ago, we accepted that you could get good information by doing good random sampling or having enough of a population sample so that you got the, 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 the data of the overall population with just a sample. So, so when you say you, you have to have everyone participate in order for the information to be useful. I, I, I'm having a hard time buying that. So c could you walk me through the logic of, of why, if you had like 60% of the institutions complying, that that wouldn't give you a good enough picture? So you really could extrapolate to the other 40%. What, what, help me with that. First of all, um, the healthcare workers um, should be feel protected throughout the state. And so to have it voluntary and have some hospitals participate and, and some not, I don't know what message that would send to the healthcare employees that are working in those institutions that are not able to participate for whatever reason. They're, they maybe have um, you know, a, short, a workforce shortage. They, they are very small, as Representative Wall said, and they maybe are struggling for whatever reason. So again, this is um, being making it required. Again, if you look at what is required under the Healthcare Associated Infection Reporting, there is no, you know, 95%. It's everyone has to report. They may not have any to report. Um, that would be great, but they all have to report that is a require is a state requirement 
Um, and I think the other problem that we have heard, and I wish Senator Sherman was here because he is very articulate when it comes to this, and I wish maybe we could have NAMI and um, DRC be here next week. They want to know, as far as the data, who is actually like where the air, where the problems lie, and are they um, uh, how how severe they are, and who is actually um, 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 in, involved in these violent incidences? Because there may be best practices that can be. Um, um, moved forward if we have more robust data. So to say 100%, you're right, I took statistics too. It's, it doesn't need to be 100%, but to have a robust database, maybe that's a better way to put it, so that we can make sure that there are best practices being implemented that are taking into account um, all the incidences that are occurring. So I I think I, I would like to ask um, the DRC and NAMI to speak because they, they're very, they're very um, um, thoughtful about this as well. Are, are, do they have representatives in here today? Maybe if they don't, Mr. Ripple, could you, could you help us get an invite to them next week? All right, thank you. Uh, and and uh, it looks like Mr. Thomas wants to respond and then um, uh, Representative Earth has a comment. Yeah, to, you, to your question, Representative Edwards, about the percentage, too, and it, and I certainly understand that you don't need 100, but how do you ensure some sort of critical mass without a requirement? Because I, I, I made this point earlier, to the extent one doesn't participate, then another won't participate, and then soon there's no incentive for any to participate. And so, I, you know, I don't know how you would mandate 75% requirement or 90% requirement. I mean, the practical thing to do would be to mandate everyone. And I and I I believe the representative from the DRC are here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you send the link to the commission study report to Mr. Ripple yes. so you can distribute it to us? That'd be great. Absolutely. Thank you. R representative Weiler. Yeah. I just want to know: Was the impetus for this bill? Is there another state? or there's a model bill or someplace this was, was copied from, and do we know anything about the experience of that other state where it came from? Um, some states, we've been, um, the impetus for this particular bill goes back to 2000, probably 18, when Representative, excuse me, Senator Gray was contacted by one of her his constituents that had been assaulted at New Hampshire Hospital because um, she's a nurse was a nurse there. That was the initial impetus for bringing all the stakeholders together um, to have this discussion. Um, since then, um, in my tenure at the Hospital Association, and I believe um, Steve Ahn and our president is here um, behind me. So, um, and he deals more at a national scale. But um, throughout this throughout the country. This has this is a major um, problem. So there have been other um, um, bills passed that actually make it a um, higher penalty, um, criminal penalty, to assault a healthcare worker. We chose very um, definitively to not go down that path. We did not um, believe that making it um, a higher penalty was actually going to be as in instructive as this would be to collect data, to have a commission, to have discussions, and come up with best practices. Um, because what we have learned um, is that in other parts of the country, it may be a feel-good um, piece of legislation, but it really doesn't do anything. Um, and, and so, and I'll let, I think the Nurses Association felt the same way. Also, as far as the model, we used um, Joint Commission um, as some of the modeling for collecting the data. We used OSHA um, the, uh, um, as far as the workplace violence prevention program model. And we used the Quality Commission, like I mentioned, that is now in statute, permanent statute here, as our model for the commission. The, um, and the warrantless arrest was um, uh, a separate discussion, and that was coming out of, as you know, the, the criminal statute, which, um, and we had the attorney generals and um, assistant attorney general involved in that. Did you want to add anything? Thank you. Okay. And 
So we have a representative from the DRC. Would you tell us your name yeah. and tell us what a DRC is? I and will. and then I, do you need any background? We've been talking now at least for 30 minutes and you've missed most of it. I, um, well, I'll, I'll introduce myself and maybe if you ask your question, I'll be able to answer and hopefully I'll be all right. Um, so I'm Karen Rosenberg. I'm the policy director at the Disability Rights Center of New Hampshire. We're the protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities. And I am aware that you're talking about um, SB 459, the workforce safety um, bill that our office was involved in, mostly my predecessor, although I was somewhat involved in the portion of this bill that deals with exceptions to the warrantless arrest statute that limits the warrant, that, that expands it slightly in cases of um, when, when individuals may really you know, present a danger and that it would negatively impact their ability to get medical care or interfere with the operations of the facility. And so we worked really, we, we, we and my predecessor worked a lot with um, Senator Rosenwald and others around and, and, and also with the hospital association around creating some language that would um, try to avoid a situation where individuals with really significant mental illness are foreclosed from securing treatment when their behavior really is the a manifestation of the disability. So, so your, your part in this bill is to make sure that it doesn't uh, go too far and basically begin to uh, penalize or do harm to patients that have mental health and other issues that have, are causing them maybe to act out. Exactly. Yeah, that's a very hard thing to find a balance for. I'm sure that was tough. It, there was a lot of wordsmithing, a lot. All right. Well, um, I, I, we could get into the confidentiality piece of this, um, but I, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll just point out that as, as a former um, privacy officer uh, at a couple of uh, uh, medical device manufacturers, uh, it, it struck me that. It's probably not appropriate on line 24 of page two to say that the names and job titles of employees involved in the incident should be reported to the overall commission. And as I'm looking at this, it, one time I read this, I thought that it also reported the name of the uh, perpetrator of the incident. But, but now that I'm looking at it again, I'm not seeing that piece. No, it actually on line 20, 36 and 37, if the incident involved a patient, the patient's name or other similar identifiers <laughs> shall not be included in the report. M mine ends at line 35 on that page. Which, oh. which, which, I'm sorry, I have the bill as introduced. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Hold on. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so we're, we're going to go ahead and we're going to protect the confidentiality of the patient's information. What if it's the patient's brother? Would the brother who's, who's acting tough in the hallway of the hospital, would, yeah. would, would his name be reportable? And, and Actually, it, on page three of the bill as amended by the House, but it's probably not the, yeah. Um, page three, lines one and two, if the incident involved a patient, the patient's name, or other similar identifier shall not be included in the report. Right, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm asking a different question now. It, it, if it happens that the patient's brother is the jerk, does that brother, does that, that name get reported? And if not, what precludes the reporting of that brother's name? So, if the person is not the patient, then they can be removed from the facility because they're trespassing. So you wouldn't consider that workplace violence if you could remove somebody for trespass? So I, that, that's not the way I read the definition. Yeah, I mean, that, that individual, to the extent they have a personal relationship with the patient, would be covered here. You're right. I mean, that's, that's, that's my understanding. Uh, the patient's name is the only one specifically protected. As to any other names, this bill is silent. 
I can tell you, you know, it was a concern of the Nurses Association back in the Senate um, that this would have included the name and job title of the employee. So right. I, I think there's an I think there's an opportunity there to. Um, right. I mean, because it explicitly to your point, Mr. Thomas, it explicitly company, yeah. says in here that the names and job titles of the employees are involved in the incident will be reported. So right. I, I, I think a lot of the concerns about confidentiality would just go away if there was a clear categorical statement that, that no identifying information could, should be submitted in any report that goes outside of the hospital. Well, I, I guess I would say to that, and, and I, think there's, I think we can certainly improve the confidentiality in this section. With respect to the larger confidentiality sh section, the one that we think is crucial to this bill, um, and these hospitals coming together and sharing information via the commission. I don't, the concern, I don't think the issue there is with respect to names or identities. The issue is with respect to the incident. Um, and if a lawsuit say was filed, any free and open discussion among the hospital members discussing that incident would then be subject to discovery. And that poses a whole new issue. And that's really what this confidentiality piece in here is intended to. Oh, okay. Protect. So there's two layers. Yes. And, and, and I just want to let you know, as I understand both layers, I agree with you, you know, that on the layer that all personal identifying information should be stricken from any report, you know, to protect personal information. I absolutely agree with you. And, it, and if, and if your point is, that uh, a level of confidentiality is required for the commission, for the commission to have conversations uh, without worrying about discovery, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with that too. I, I just, I, I don't think they need to be talking about people, mm -hmm. they need to be talking about incidents. And can I just clarify one thing, because this was discussed. The report is is going to, um, through rulemaking, going to the commissioner. It's not going anywhere else. It was just the way that we were, as opposed to submitting every single incident, it was a requested by, um, it may have been by the urgent care centers, to create an annual report. But it will be determined, we're trying to figure out the components of it, um, and then it can be submitted annually to the commissioner via rulemaking. Um, so that's where the, the annual report is probably the right, the wrong terminology maybe, but um, that's what that was intended. But I think, I think Karen wanted to say something. Well, I, this wasn't the section that we really worked on, but what I've noticed in reading this is that it, the information that would identify the patient also must be withheld. So if you knew who the brother was, that would that could necessarily identify the patient. So I think that this may address your concern, Representative Edwards. If you look at, I, uh, I agree, it gets close. I'm not sure that it closes it, but okay. uh, so so it's now 404, and uh, uh, General Gray just walked through the door. Senator Gray, excuse me, old habits. Uh, and 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 I and I just wanted to. Uh, it, right before you came in, sir, I intended to close the discussion on the bill that brought you here, uh, but we'll keep it going for another five, ten minutes if you'd like to talk to us. We have other people here to talk about the next bill that have been waiting patiently for an hour. My, my, my goal in having, you, you can sit down and use that mic or where, whatever you want to do. Uh, Mr. Chair, it won't take long. I actually came to see Representative Bean. So I didn't come to testify in the bill, and I don't uh, care to at this time. Oh, okay, and I, I'm going to take you up on your offer to give you a call later, Senator Gray. Uh, I, I got your phone number now. So, um, okay, so what was the point of this last hour? The point of this last hour is that I, 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 I have some concerns, and hopefully those concerns are shared by other members of, of this committee now that we've had a chance to talk about them, that I, w I wanted to expose because um, the, 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 we only have Monday and Tuesday to finish this committee's work before we have to pass it to the full finance committee. So over the weekend, I'm gonna be playing with an amendment that to me preserves the policy aspect of it, but does it in a respectful way of all of the parties involved, meaning I'm not going to threaten them with uh, penalties if they don't if they choose not to comply and and I, I, I will 
share that with you, obviously, and and we'll have another opportunity to discuss it maybe Monday or Tuesday. But but at that point, the difference between this discussion and that one would be you would at least be able to see the words and say here on page four you really screwed up. So so we'll get out of the generalities and into the specifics. So um, is is that is that can you guys come back for that? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, and Re before we close, uh, Representative Norgren, do you have something? Thank you. So can you just clarify what you said? <laughs> I guess one of my concerns in the whole discussion is the difference between making this mandatory or voluntary. And I, and I think that's something we really need to settle um, before we get too much further down the road with this and bringing in amendments. Um, specifically, I think it would be a disservice to workers if we weren't consistent and uniform across the board when we're trying to implement this. So I, I think that's really an important point for the whole bill on whether or not it's voluntary or mandatory. So, so you're making an argument for it being mandatory yes. and coercive. Yeah. which is fine we yeah. can we can have that discussion i'm just suggesting that at this point let's wrap this conversation up go to 459 knowing that we're going to have another 458 excuse me knowing that we're going to have another conversation with something uh, in front of us uh, next week okay. I, I i just still maintain my position that the the cost of this system goes from a lot to zero when we keep it from being mandatory to saying it's voluntary. The concern I've heard is that if we make it voluntary, we're gonna lose uh, everyone's participation, we're gonna lose the data, we're gonna lose you know, uh, the standardization. And I think that's a, a challenge, but I, I, I think we can get there. Now, I will write something, people can look at it, and if, and if, and if I've accidentally killed the patient in the process, then then you guys can tell me that next week. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Representative Walls. Real quick, I'd like to point out, having gone through this bill closely while everybody was talking, that the fines are under a may. It's the, the fines are by no means mandatory. It's that the commissioner of HHS may impose the fines, and that presumably would be for some sort of egregious offense, but it's by no means mandatory fines when people don't comply. So I just thought I'd point that out. That's one place it is a may, not a shall. So to that extent, I'm happy with it. I, 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 I just don't think, anyways, it's, I, I'm not a big fan of the state punishing people for uh, things that should be voluntary. That's all. I'm sorry. I'm just here to protect everyone's rights. That's, that's why I get up in the morning. Um, all right. So if there are no other, and Representative Bean, I heard you, and I'll, I'll show you what I've done with the definitions because I agree with you. Um, all right, so with that, I'll close out 459 and uh, open uh, 458. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, some of us need a, a, a five minute um, break, so we're going to recess for just five minutes.
So, uh, Representative Long, I, can I? Do you mind if I get started? I see Representative Nordgren, and then Representative Walls can join us. And okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to call uh, this work session of Division Three back into session uh, after a recess. Uh, we're we're now going to talk about Senate Bill. 458 relative to the Sununu Youth Services Center and operation of a replacement secure facility. Senator Daniels uh, was the prime sponsor in the Senate and Representative Rice uh, co-sponsored it out of the House Children and Family Law. There was, um, this, this just got passed yesterday uh, and got sent to our committee. We have today, Monday and Tuesday, to do nothing or to do something with this bill. So, so I scheduled this uh, in somewhat in haste because I wanted to at least begin the dialogue so that over the weekend some language could maybe be prepared to deal with the big rocks that we see here and uh, so that we can have a, a complete precise discussion next week, but we want to get some things exposed out onto the table. And I need somebody to uh, help me tee this up. So uh, Senator Daniels, would you would you mind stepping forward with Representative Lynn? And, um, and then based on uh, prior conversations, <coughs> I, th I, th I think uh, I, I, I can help get some things into the record uh if if your opening statement doesn't get there so relax do you do you want to tell us about your thoughts about what the house amendment did to the original senate bill that has you concerned please i'm a couple degrees of separation from that because they were in the senate i was actually uh looking more toward going toward the private uh, how, housing, so um, I think probably uh, Representative Lynn might have a better perspective as to what, what you did in the House. Representative Lynn? Well, I, I guess what, what I would say is, I mean, as, as everybody here knows, I had a, uh, I opposed the, the, uh, the part of the bill that my main concern with was with the part of the bill that added the language from uh, House Bill 254, um, there were um, in, in addition, and, and that you know I I oppose that the, the House did not agree with my position, and I, I then proposed a floor amendment. The House did not agree with my position on that either. Um, I, I for purposes of this, I will say I I I believe that my position was correct, and I still believe that. Uh, but the other things that the court that the uh, that the uh, bill um, that I think there's a difference between the Senate and the House version of the bill, which um, might draw a different, you know, different reactions from from people are in terms of the size of of the facility. Um, as I understand it, the Senate bill was for an 18 bed facility. And the version that was passed by the House was for a six-bed facility. Um, I candidly had not focused on that particular issue, the size of the facility. I, as I said yesterday, I, I firmly support the idea of having a new facility. Um, I hadn't particularly focused on the size, uh, but I do I do think that the that six beds um, is seems to me to be not adequate um it's you know as i understand it and i people who have much more expertise in this in terms of the ongoing things that have happened you know recently but as i understand it for at least the last couple of years um where there's been a focused effort to to have the the sununu center reduced to the sort of the smallest population that is kind of reasonably that that reasonably makes sense um, that's been ongoing for a couple of years, and as I understand it, that has the current population of the Sununu Center is somewhere between 10 and 15 people, roughly uh, split equally between uh, uh, minors who are in pretrial, uh, pre-adjudication detention and minors who have been adjudicated. 
um, that sends would seem to me to suggest that it it would be very hard to get below that number. And so, you know, having a having a facility that's only six beds um, just doesn't seem to me to make to make a lot of sense. Um, and I don't think, and I particularly in light of what I hope uh, other people will will be here to say, particularly in light of the fact that the change in the 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 crime the the offenses for which a juvenile can be committed under uh, under the amendment under the under 254 as it was amended have there aren't there are virtually no people that are committed to to sununu now that that you know would be excluded under this uh under the amendment so that's not the if the thought is that that's somehow going to reduce the population of the sununu center it just doesn't seem to me it is factually accurate so, that's- so let me let me let me just restate that because I I, I think that's a critical point that uh, the amendment uh, attempted to bring in the provisions of uh, House Bill 254, which were uh, restrictions on what type of cases for which a, a, a juvenile was was found guilty of, it restricted the the cases. Uh, for which they could, they might be incarcerated, with the idea that by doing that they would end up uh, directly being able to reduce the census at the Sununu Center, and that based on a review of the data at DCYF, even with had the full provisions of the restrictions of 254 been in place, it would not have affected the census. It would not have reduced the census. Is is that your is that, that, that what you think? That's my understanding. It's my understanding, and Mr. Ribson, I think, would be much more you know would, could give you much more accurate that. But it is my understanding, for example, that there is nobody that is incarcerated at the, or, or detained. I mean, committed or de, or even detained at the Sununu Center for only a property crime where the person doesn't prevent doesn't present any any danger of of. Uh, of personal injury, and that there is that there isn't anybody, and I think with maybe very rare exceptions that Mr. Ripson can talk about, there isn't anybody that has been committed to the Sununu Center for only a misdemeanor where they don't have three prior misdemeanors. There isn't anybody that that um, that has been uh, committed there for that, and I think it's pretty rare, as I understand it, even for the three strikes uh, person to be committed there. But Mr. Ripson can talk about that. Do you have anything else to add to that? Um, uh, I do not. No, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Ripson, could you could you come up and wait, 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 wait? Sorry. Sorry Are there Daniels. other questions? Can I ask? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Daniels, I wonder if you might uh, just take a moment to speak to your original bill, which, as I understand it, uh, was a privately run operation, and speak to how that. Uh, uh, address the size issue? Uh, <clears throat> and I think in, in light of the discussions that have taken place later where some people believe the number should be six, some people believe it should be 12, some people believe it should be 18, uh, going the private route with existing facilities already out there gives you a flexibility that you don't have to try to guess what the right size in building a new facility is so I, I think you've got that ability to just pay for the people who are actually there if, if that happens to be six if it if it fluctuates up to 18 you do that but you, you're paying for what you have as opposed to building something and maybe have it two-thirds empty or maybe have it full uh, thank you <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman I have just one other thing before you, uh, which I hope you'll ask uh, Mr. Ripson about because you raised a question on the floor yesterday that I think is really a very critical point here, and that is what are the potential unintended consequences of the 254 uh, in terms, and I think it does, that this could potentially have cost implications because, the, and one of the consequences, it seems to me, is by removing the option of potentially treating some serious property offender as a as a as a minor through the juvenile justice system, um, 
you raise the potential that a, that you know in some cases some cases some prosecutor is going to say this kid needs to be committed for some period of time and if i don't have the option of of going through the juvenile system my only option is to petition to have this this minor treated as an adult um, because then then he can be committed of course the commitment then at least until the person was 18 would be back at the at the Sununu center but but uh, that that would then not be subject to the 254 i think that's a real possibility that something like that could happen and i don't think anybody certainly not me wants to, wants the you know wants that to happen where somebody could be treated through the juvenile system more appropriately uh, representative Irv. thank you mr chair uh, just to follow up on that point so if somebody was being tried as an adult could they also be held at a, in an adult prison under current law my my understanding and i asked uh, mr ripson to correct me because i haven't dealt with this you know in a, in a couple of years but my understanding is they that 18 whether whether it's mandatory that that's where they be held or whether there is some discretion either with the court or with dcyf or the the DCYF or the or the Department of Corrections to make that decision. I'm not positive of that, frankly, because I just haven't dealt with it in a while. Thank you. Uh, let, let me finish on this. Uh, oh, you, I thought I did too, but you go ahead. I was going to talk about PREA. Is that what you're going to talk about, the Prison Rape Elimination Act? I was going to use the acronym that I was going to talk about, the federal law that requires the separation of juveniles well, go right ahead. I wasn't sure anybody else was familiar with it. You're, I'm intimately you're, you're the attorney. Go for it. Um, so quite a number of years ago, probably more than a decade, Congress passed a law called the Prison Rape Elimination Act, PREA, as it was known. They chose not to enforce it for a long time. Eventually, they decided to start enforcing it. And at that point, New Hampshire, in a bill that I was uh, shepherding through the legislature, um, chose to raise the age of adulthood from 17 to 18. You probably represent. I do, yep, I do remember that. And, and PREA was honestly the reason it happened, because under PREA, you cannot house people under the age of 18 in the same area as anybody, as any adult, in other words, 18 and over. Okay, and so what it was practically going to mean is every one of the county jails and the state prison was going to have to build separate facilities for 17 uh, year olds being treated as adults, but being held in adult facilities. And everybody recognized that that was not a wise use of money to build 11 new separate facilities around the state. So we were able to get through the bill that raised the age to 18 to stop that. So when you have somebody now certified as an adult, they still cannot be held with other adults in the prison. That's federal law that prohibits that. So that, that's the answer to your question um, along the way is that uh, they can be held in the state prison, but they would have to have a facility where they're totally isolated from adults. Um, it's not the building, it's the exposure to adults that, that is limited. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you for that. I just, I, you know, I hadn't dealt with that l recently for sure, and I'm not sure I ever, ever actually had a case that raised that issue. But thank I you. had a Appreciate lot it. of dealing with it, so that's why I chose to raise my hand. All right. If there are no other questions from the reps, uh, we'll bring Mr. Ribson up. Thank, thank you all. And and while you're walking up, um, it, it's my understanding of the history on this is that. We've known for a long time that we have, that we, uh, in retrospect, overbuilt the Sununu Center, and uh, and that uh, as a result of the sprawling complex that we were spending more money than we really needed to, and what was productive, and so um, so uh, while the legislator le legislature was dealing with it, uh, the department also dealt with it and you brought in a consultant uh alvarez and there's an m there marcel, marcel. I, I keep wanting to say martinez but i'm sure i'd get drug away for racism or something if i did that marcel uh so alvarez and marcel and they looked at all of the census data 
and kind of independently applied their consulting hat to it, and they came up with a recommendation of 18, as I understand it, and that the department has since verified, looking at their data and, and kind of thinking of it on their own, that 18 is sort of the, the smallest capacity you could, you could try to work with. And that, and that to take that one step further, there's absolutely no data to suggest that six is a good number. Now, now, now with that introduction, uh, why don't you re respond to that and then whatever else you want to about this bill. Sure. Thank you, Representative Edwards. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. Joe Ripsom, Director of DCYF. Um, yes, the department um, commissioned last, you know, last year when we were going through this budget process and this conversation was happening and um, the decision was made to commission uh, Alvarez and Marcel to work with us and, and a group. It was actually a work group that included some members of the legislature, included some stakeholders, um, included some of the advocacy community um, to come up with recommendations. And the final recommendation that came out of that report was to uh, build an 18-bed facility. The number 18 was based on the data of what we currently see today. And I don't have the data with me today, but I can bring it next week if folks would like to see it. Um, which shows what the average daily census has been. Now, the census has dropped radically over the years, right? We had, when I first moved to this state four and a half years ago, there was some days where we had 75 kids in that building. Um, today, the average daily census is about 12, but that is an average daily census. It bounces between about eight and 16 New Hampshire kids. And I do wanna clarify that I'm only talking about the kids that are there under New Hampshire law. We do have a contract with Vermont to serve some of those kids. We exclude those kids from the data because we were asked very early on from folks to make sure that we weren't counting those kids for the purpose of this conversation. So all the data we share does not include the Vermont kids. Um, and we have within that building that those 18 beds that we think that we need have to really be able to be structured in a way to serve three discrete populations that sometimes need to be separated from each other. So we have females in that building as well as males and same thing in the future state. Um, over the last two years, looking at the data based on a question uh, Representative Earth sent me earlier, I took a closer look than I had before, so I appreciated his questions. Um, at the peak, we've had seven females in that building in the past two years at one, on one given day. Um, so the most females you'd have on a day is about seven, based on the last two years worth of data. We've had days where I, th I think it was 14 or 15 males in the facility on one given day. Now, we've not had that happen at once where you had 21 kids in the building at once in the last two years. It's happened that you had less females, more males. It's played out to be around a daily I said average of 12, but could be at its peak 15 to 16 kids and at its base about eight kids. Um, we need to be able to separate those populations though, which is why even though we only presume an average daily census of 12, you do need to have some additional beds in the building. Um, females have to be kept separately, so you need to have a space that can hold your maximum capacity of females. And then your males, it's not uncommon that they have to be separated. We actually try to have them all in one unit when we can, but it's not uncommon for us to get a court order requiring that two males be separated because they've been involved in some type of common activity outside and the court wants them separated when they're within the building because they don't want them talking to each other about whatever common activities that they were in or where you have treatment needs of kids that are such that they can't be together safely or where you know two guys just can't be together and part of our job with them is to work with them through that but that doesn't happen instantly and having them in one housing unit's not safe so that's why we get to the number of 18 to give us some flexibility in how we use our different units um, even though the average daily census we presume is 12. Uh, in terms of I'm sorry go ahead, I, I think I think um, there's also a fourth category needing to keep them separated as, as I understand um, uh, there are uh, gang activities that take place in that uh, separating gangs in an, in an incarceration setting is essential for maintaining safety, that, that you don't want to have opposing gang members co-located. Yeah, you know, and I think it's, um, so it's interesting because most of the gang activity we see here are more like kind of smaller organizations. It's fortunate we don't have a lot of the kids involved in kind of national gangs, but you do see kind of smaller um, smaller kind of street organizations of kids. And in fact, you know, we will try to, to help remediate those situations and eventually allow those kids to actually be together in one unit too. But that's a circumstance where when if two kids come in from the outside, they were going to be at each other's throats that you don't want to put them together 
immediately until you actually have the chance to do some restorative justice work with those kids and get them, you know, in a place where they can be together in one, one, one's place, which is one of our goals and one of the things we try to do when those situations come up. Um, yeah, and then, you know, the, the populations, as we heard before, right, um, that are served there, it's all detained kids. So those are kids who are pretrial. Um, a lot of times detained kids might only be there for a couple days and then the court will release them to some type of shelter program or or back to the community. Um, but they could be there sometimes for an extended period of time if they're um, pending adult charges. They could be there for months and months and months and if they're ultimately um, found guilty on those adult charges they'll remain with us until they turn 18. Your committed population on the other hand, those are the kids who have been adjudicated by the court. They typically only spend about three months in the facility unless it's a particularly egregious crime then it might be six months. But typically, um, typically your committed population is there for a relatively short time. Your detained population is there for typically a couple of weeks but like I said that could be a lot longer. And for some kids who are pending adult charges, it could be years that they're in there in that, that detained status. Um, fortunately, what we see today in New Hampshire is very limited use of adult charges for kids. Um, the, the, of those that I can remember, the only cases that I remember of kids having adult charges have been for murder and attempted murder since of those I can recall. It's pretty unusual. Um, that leads me to some of my concerns, though, that I heard in the prior conversation uh, when, when Judge Lynn was on, up here around 254, and the potential that when you change those rules, you potentially change the behavior of prosecutors and judges. Um, if our prosecutors and judges don't think they can keep the community safe with the rules, they're going to find the other rules that would allow them to do so. And I think that's exactly what you were hearing Judge Lynn express, a concern that um, some of the, we don't know what the outcome of these changes are going to be, and it actually could result in more kids being charged as adults, and therefore result in more kids spending more time at the facility, even though it might not be in their best interest. Um, so I, you know, I do, I do um, recommend caution when thinking about those provisions uh, being added to this bill. Um, you know, 254 already passed the House; it's in the Senate; it's being considered there. Um, but we're not sure what that bill is going to do to the census. I know some people believe it's going to drastically reduce the census. Until I see that happen, I'm not going to believe it because what 254 has done is it's, yes. So do you know uh, for sure that HB 254 is, is in the Senate and has not been voted on by the whole Senate? I don't know for sure what the posture is in the whole Senate. I, know I, I see Mr. DeJoy nodding his head. You, you know that to be true? It's in committee. It's not been voted out by the Senate. Okay, but it's an it's an active bill. Good, good. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. it's an active bill in the Senate. Um, again, what I say is uh, what's uncertain about it is 254 has kind of changed the rules. It's limited the types of first-time offenses that could come in, but it also created a new exception looking at kind of community safety, um, uh, risk of bodily injury. And that's a new kind of standard or loophole that hasn't been applied in the past, the kind of old way that under the current law that that gets addressed is the uh, kind of three strikes you're out for lesser offenses um, provision. So swapping from one kind of pathway to let kids use the juvenile, let, let judges and prosecutors have the juvenile system as an option to another pathway, um, this new one in 254, I don't know that that's going to result in less kids. It could result in more kids. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's a really risky proposition to look at that as a policy and for us to, without any data to evaluate it, just assume it's going to drive the census down to a number that has never been seen before. And I, you know, I've heard some people make arguments that if we build it to 18, that the state's gonna fill it. I think the, the counterpoint that I would make to that is we have a facility for 144 today and we have, you know, on average 12. So we're not trying to fill that facility. I think the, the system has changed dramatically in the last few years to try to minimize the use of a facility like that. But, um, but that it, when we have those situations where we need to keep the community safe, there needs to be some place to use. So, so would you believe that I, in the conversation I had with uh, the chairman of the judiciary, Representative Gordon, about this, that he said that uh, it's his understanding that the the judges of New Hampshire have actively, over a five year period of time, been much more careful about ensuring that only the kids that needed to go to Sununu went to Sununu. Would you Would you believe that? Yeah, and I think it's there's a, there's a number of changes over the past five years. So there's multiple things that have led to this result of a reduced census. Right, we have changes in law about the offenses that can be 
refer to Sununu. You've had changes in practice amongst judges and prosecutors, largely driven by leadership in the in the in the courts. Right, Judge Kelly previously and Judge Ashley today really focused on this issue. Um, changes within our DCYF's juvenile probations, thinking about the use of this facility, the creation of a system of care and different out different in-home options for kids and different residential options for kids. It did not exist five years ago. And I think in Constellation, those things are what have driven, thankfully, the census down. Um, but, you know, what change another, you know, what change 254 is going to make is something that I'm just not comfortable predicting. And I think it's a risky proposition for us to to just have faith that somehow it's going to achieve a result that we're not, to have no evidence of. And, and, and it sounds like you you indicated that we may actually end up with a, a an adverse twist is that if if uh, if it doesn't look like a, a kid can be incarcerated under the juvenile code that may incline the judge to go with a criminal uh, uh, prosecution which then creates a permanent record for that youth and still they end up in Sununu. We, so we didn't save anything on the Sununu side. And we might actually end up with a kid having a much longer sentence by going through the adult side before they got to Sununu. So this could, this could be like a double backfire. Is that, is that a fair summary of what you said? Yeah, I agree. I think there's a, a, a large risk of that. Uh, Representative Irv. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Ribson, for taking my question. You mentioned the system of care. I wonder if you could speak to how that is impacting that investment that the state has been making over the past years and is currently in the, in the current biennium, how that's impacting the census currently and how it might impact it uh, in the future. Yeah, so there's, there's, there are so many changes that have happened to the child and family serving system over the past four years that it's hard to talk about concisely, but I'll, I'll try. So when we talk about the system of care, really we're specifically talking about children's behavioral health services, which work alongside of, but not within DCYF, right? So historically DCYF basically was the de facto children's behavioral health system. There was nowhere for a kid or family to turn to have their needs met without coming into juvenile justice or child protection, which doesn't make sense. If kids have behavioral health needs, families should be able to drive their care and get access to care. And that's what the system of care in the big picture does. Now, the way that it's done that was, you know, the key ways that it's done that was creating a couple key programs. One of them, something that we call Fast Forward, which is a high fidelity wraparound program for kids and their families to to kind of help guide through um, through the behavioral health needs of the child, connect them to in-home supports, peer supports, and same thing with the family. Um, that service, you know, five years ago didn't exist. Three years ago, served 60 kids. Today is serving over 500 kids. That service, I think, has had a, lar a lot to do with the fact that we have less kids, not just at SYSC, but less kids on probation, right? It's not just about SYSC, which is the deepest end of the system. A service like that impacts the entire juvenile justice system, right? All those kids on probation. Um, and there used to be thousands of those kids, and now it's into the hundreds. Um, when I say used to, I'm talking about years and years ago, not five years ago, 10, 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> The other services that go along with that are things that we at DCYF have in, been doing to align with what's called the Family First Services Prevention Act, which um, uh, included us moving to different evidence-based models of care. Um, so we have two that we've procured, have gotten contracts for, got GNC approval for, and are currently running. We have three more that we're working on, but the two that are currently live and running are multi-systemic therapy, which is really specifically targeted for working for high-risk juvenile population, um, kids with the types of behaviors that we see within the juvenile justice system, and works very closely with that kid, their family, and their community to try to keep that kid safe in their community and out of residential inclu programs, including SYSC. And then the other one that we have live today is called Intercept. That one's a little more focused on the parent side of that equation. So typically is used more in child protection, but is sometimes used in juvenile justice. But those things have both, um, those things in concert with the system of care are driving down the need for high-end facilities like SYSC or residential care for kids. And that's why it's so important you build out those community services. What I would say, the second part of your question was, where do you think, where do I think that's gonna lead it? In the long run, I do think that could lead to an even further reduced census. 
But when I say long run, I want to be careful. I'm not saying in the next one or two years. It could help in the next one or two years. When it really helps is when the current crop of 10-year-olds have had access to that service as 12-year-olds and don't end up the way that our 17-year-olds are today that are showing up at SYSC, right? So you're talking about kind of the next crop of kids benefiting from preventative early services, not getting as deep in the system. That's not where we are today. The kids who are there today didn't have the benefit of that system. Um, so I do think it'll continue to drive the numbers down. I just... I just don't think we can really say that it's going to drive the numbers down in the immediate term. So, so you mentioned two new programs, or relatively new programs. What, what, what are the age of those programs, and, and how mature do you think they are, and what sort of uh, information are you getting from them that give you confidence in sort of the predictive, your predictive ability from them? So those two that I mentioned are relatively new to New Hampshire. They've both been alive in this state only since MST started serving families in January and the current, iter I'm sorry, in December, and the current iteration of Intercepts only started serving families in January. So I don't think we're seeing anything in those numbers. Where my, where my faith in them comes from is the research behind them and the way that they've been used in jurisdictions around the country proving to have results in these areas. So I believe that they're going to have those impacts, but they're not yet. Where I think we are seeing impacts today from the system of care is that fast forward program that I spoke about, which has been serving kids now for about, you know, I think first started about four ish years ago. Um, like I said, only serving 60 and today serving somewhere like 500. Uh, thank you. Do, do you have do you have any general com? I, I I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at the bill as amended by the House yesterday, but uh, in the off chance that you have, do you have any other general comments you'd like to make? And then I'd like to invite the other representatives to ask you questions as well. Uh, no, no other comments. I mean, I think the the bill as it as it came over from the Senate was we we thought was in pretty good shape. Um, you know, I think the change in the the change in the number, as we already spoke about, is something that concerns me. Um, and the addition of two fifty four is something that I just I'm not sure what the impact is going to be on SY on the operation of a future facility. So I, you know, it just adds it adds uncertainty into the equation when we think about building a new a new a new a new facility. Uh, thank you. Are there questions, Representative Walls? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So. The House established the policy yesterday, the six-bed policy, and despite what um, Mr. Ripson may want, that is the policy of the House, and we are not a policy committee, so we are supposed to be addressing the policy passed by the House. So I noticed that the fiscal note on this was drafted to deal with an 18-bed facility, and I'm wondering if we can ask Mr. Ripson's office or whoever does this to draft the fiscal note on a six-bed facility because that is the policy of the House, and that's what this committee should be looking at. And and it seems to me that we're not gonna we're gonna have a hard time doing our job if the only fiscal note is on a facility that is not the policy of the House. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Mr. Chairman, that was a request to you to make that request of Mr. Ripson so that we have the information we need to do our job next week. You, you, you based it on a, on a premise that I don't agree with, though. Uh, the premise is that by, by looking at the issues of the insertion of 254 and the change of uh, capacity from 18 to 6, that those are policy issues that we should not be dealing with. But I, I think in, in the, intrinsically, those have cost implications because of the way that the whole system would operate under one scenario of the future versus another. And so I, 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 I don't feel as constrained about the policy limitations that, that I think you would have us impose on ourselves I, 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 I'm more comfortable dealing with the policy because the policy establishes the operations and the effectiveness. And to me, that, that gets into efficiency and effectiveness, which are financial issues. I'm, I, I know you can disagree with me, and, and you probably do. So would you, would, you, would you please just make your request directly to Mr. Ripson because I, I don't want any part of it? I'd be happy to, Mr. Ribson, given that that is the official policy of the House as of yesterday, so that the Finance Committee has accurate information, 
that they can deal with all possibilities, not just the cost of an 18-bed facility, but the cost of a six-bed six facility, and the cost possibly of a facility where we rehab an existing building, which can be done inexpensively and quickly. And I point to the fact that I know on the Gallon campus, the old state hospital campus, there's that row, if you're facing it from Pleasant Street, there's that row of large houses along there. In fact, one of them just burned a week or two ago, although not badly, because I actually looked at it. Um, and something like that, that we may already own, that is near the state hospital, where the, the therapists that these children would need would be right there on the same campus with them. You know, that's something that I believe the state should be considering, is something like that, where Concord High is right down the road. The, the therapists are right there. We've got the buildings on campus. I don't know what the current use of them, but I know at least one of them was under rehab. And I'm wondering if there's that or even building a new facility, if we can have for the finance committee, the fiscal notes on what it would mean to rehab or to build a six bed facility. And I, I'm not alone on this. I've had discussions with other members of the finance committee that would like that information so that we have all the information that we need to make an appropriate decision next week. Yeah, I think the, the challenge is simply the timing, right? We, were, we, were, we had worked with a legislative committee um, in the fall worked with DAS to come up with the estimate of building a facility that was 18 beds because that's what the conversation was at that moment. The conversation today has shifted, but the process of actually doing that type of analysis isn't going to be something that's gonna happen over this weekend. Um, and it's not something that DCYF is actually even capable of doing. We'd have to partner with um, administrative services to do that work. Well, is it possible to make that request of DAS to even give us a back of the envelope so that we're not looking at this totally blindly? Certainly can may, be may I redirect your Thank question you. to, to just Mr. Ripple because I think the LBA is essentially responsible for fiscal notes and we're uh, kind of stomping around in his turf. I'm good with that. I just want do, the information. Do you have a comment, Mr. Ripple? Uh, my only comment is we did send out requests to the agencies today for this and the various other bills that the House amended yesterday. So, um, again, I'm not sure what we'll get back uh, by Monday. Uh, that, that's all I know so far. Mr. Ellinghouse is pretty good. I've dealt with him too here in finance and I'm amazed what his office can do sometimes. Uh, uh, Represent along. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just on that issue, uh, there may be a unit price or a square footage price. Uh, it's pretty much all you're gonna do is the multiplier. Um, With respect to the new, the two new programs in the fast forward, um, has capacity been an issue? Um, the the high fidelity wraparound programs, um, fast forward, they're they've served so many more kids, but there's more demand than we currently have slots for. Not slots in terms of what's authorized to be paid for, but slots in terms of not having the workforce yet to fill all of that demand. Okay. Particularly a subcomponent of that that we call TREC, that's um, not remembering what the acronym stands for right now, but essentially that's the program that is that goes in when kids are at SYSC or in a residential program to help provide that type of support and transition back to the community when they leave that program so they don't end up having to come back into this level of care. Um, in particular, we've not been able to hire enough clinicians to, to, to bring that out. And again, it's not a matter of not having the resources, it's a matter of the workforce not, not being available fast enough to meet the demand that's growing. The other two programs being relatively new are still in their ordinary kind of growth as new programs, so I don't know that I can say yet that it's um, what their workforce issues are, but I imagine given that the entire social service and mental health space is being challenged right now in terms of workforce, that, that that's gonna be a challenge for them as well. Okay, uh, follow up by me. So so if there's a, um, if, if, do you anticipate with the other two new programs that if the, uh, the kids needs get larger, more kids, do you anticipate the same workforce sh shortage? Or that's just a wait and see? I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow the, the question, but. So the two new programs mm -hmm. are, are new, so there's probably not a lot of kids in there right now, but as they build up the, the clients, do you anticipate workforce shortages there? I mean, if yeah, we look at the I, clinicians. 
Thank you. Thank you for, and thanks for reiterating it for me. Yeah, I do anticipate that they will probably experience the same challenges that all of the social service and mental health providers in the state are facing in terms of, of workforce um, issues. Like I said, they're both kind of too new to say that that's a driving, a driving issue, but I wouldn't be at all surprised given that we hear that from every provider in this space today. Okay, so so if you if you feel that we should be um, so as we move forward and anticipate community services are available in some areas that will may not you know in the Manchester Nashua larger municipalities that may not be the case the capacity will be limited. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, yeah, that's going to be part of the growing pains of building out new systems, as okay. as is always the case, building out new services. I think what I would say, and this is, um, is that my experience building out a very similar system in New Jersey was eventually the market did correct, right? We saw schools of social work grow. We saw new ones getting developed. I heard recently there's another school up here, another university here in New Hampshire that's planning on adding a social work program because of the increased demand. So I think, you know, what, and that's the same thing we saw in New Jersey when we built our system of care there is the demand grew eventually the, the market corrected, but it, it's not instant, it's certainly not quick. And uh, one more if I may. With respect to the, uh, with respect to privatized, uh, my understanding was Utah um, did that, and now they're going back to state operated. Yeah, part of part of the um, part of the work that we did looking at um, how to replace SYSC was visiting other jurisdictions and seeing some of their some of their programs to see if there's anything we wanted to emulate. Frankly, we didn't see anything that we wanted to emulate. We wanted to do something that was that was new and and I think better than what what we saw in other places. Um, but yes, we did one of the facilities we visited in Utah was a privately run facility um, through two different companies that ultimately the state of Utah d decided to take over because they because it was because they weren't pleased with the results they were getting there. Okay. Um, very good. Thank you. All right. I, I had informally told myself that we'd try to st wrap up by five. It's uh, 458. Uh, I don't want to cut you off if you've got anything else you want to say or for any other representatives like Representative Nordgren have a question. Thank you very much. I'm short in my chair here. So we are the finance committee. So I just don't want us to lose lose um, sight of the fact that on that the co bill we got from HHS has six beds in it. The, pardon me? Um, and then on page seven, if there were a page number, um, on the fiscal note, it's for 18 beds. And then I would also call attention to the fact that on the second page of the fiscal note, it says that the money would be appropriated from the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, and other discretionary funds, federal funds made available, just so we keep in our mind that we've got sort of different balls in the air about the size and where the money would come from um, that we need to resolve before we pass it to the full committee. Thank you. Mr. Are there any other questions? Uh, okay, so Mr. Ribson, is, is last call. Is there anything that uh, you wanted to say that you've not yet had a chance to say? No, thank you. Okay, and then so we have distinguished guests in the audience. Is there anyone in the audience? Uh, uh, the Honorable Neil Kirk, I believe. The, I assume you're still honorable. That's for you to decide, sir. Uh, thank you for the record. I'm Neil Kirk. I live in the town of Ware, and I'm here representing myself. As many of you know, I was a state representative for over 30 years. Um, on House Bill 458, this, uh, sorry, Senate Bill 458, and this being the Finance Committee, um, I think there are two kinds of costs that the committee needs to consider before reaching a decision. One is the operating cost and one is the construction costs. You basically have three things you're considering, keeping children in the Sununu Center, um, building a new facility or rehabbing some sort of a facility, or placing the children in a private facility. For each of those, were I on the committee, I would want to know what's the cost of construction, the capital costs, and for each of them, what are the operating costs? 
Uh, one of the advantages of going to a private facility that we have not had with the Sununu Center is that the private, the private facility charges a per child per day fee, whereas the Sununu Center or a state-operated 12, 6, 18-bed facility is going to have only fixed costs. The private facility has variable costs. So should we, for the first couple of years, have 12 or 15 children in a private facility, we'd be paying per child per day, roughly $2,000. Um, and if we were to uh, drop down to 12 or 6 children, obviously, for that period of time, it would be a smaller number times 2000 per day. In order to justify the committee's decisions, I think that kind of information is essential. Um, secondly, there's a timing issue here. As I read the current bill, uh, it allows up to 2026 to construct the new facility. It's supposed to be done by 2024, but some committee has the right to extend that date for another two years. So the real question is, what's going to happen to the children between now, now and the time the new facility, assuming it's not a private facility, which could meet the statutory deadline of March 1st, 2023. But assuming you decide to go with a, a, a state-operated facility, um, the new facility is not going to be open until 2024 at the earliest and most likely 2026. We know it takes three or four years for us to design and construct uh, new facilities, such as the new parking garage that's being proposed. I wouldn't count on any of you uh, operating that during your next uh, session here. Um, so the way the bill is set up, the children are going to be at the Sununu Center, our existing Sununu Center, between now and the time the new facility is operated, is, is opened. That's costing you roughly $13 million a year, or approximately $1 million a year per child. Oh, oh, by the way, you might want to check with Mr. Ribson, how much are we charging Vermont for their children here when it costs us roughly a million a year per child? Are we charging them a million a year? I'd be surprised, but it's possible. So here's a suggestion for you to consider. Um, if you decide to go with a state-run facility, a new facility, whether it's rehabbing or a separate new facility, there's going to be a long period of time before those children are in that facility. Why not, during that period of time, close the Sununu Center by the statutory date, which is 3123, and put the children between now and then in a private facility? Two advantages. For those who doubt whether a private private facility works, you'll have an opportunity to determine that, and you'll be saving money in the meantime. So I hope that the committee will get the financial inf information it needs to make the kind of quality decisions that this committee is known for, and that um, you might consider the timing alternative or option that I proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will you take questions? But of course. Um, okay. So this this is not a service that I uh, have ever gone out and looked for you know some place for my kids to be put for a few weeks maybe maybe I needed to and I just didn't but uh, are you aware of there being vendors in this space in New Hampshire that we could actually contract with to take kids that um, basically demand um, a relatively tight security environment and therapy Yes, one is Beckett, and the other is RF, NFI, NFI. Uh, both of those would likely bid on this facility. Um, okay, just to, so so just to make sure I I'm understanding because I'm learning new things here. You're, you're saying, uh, come on up, Mr. DeJoy, thank you. Uh, you're saying that today we have at least two <laughs> vendors that could receive an RFI or an RFP and respond who are in the state able to provide therapy uh, and also able to assure appropriate security and uh, all the prevention of sexual assault that we would have to worry about as well. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, just to clarify, no one has spoken with any of any vendor. Then I've reached out to vendors. Vendors aren't comfortable talking about this type of an issue when it's in process. So no one's talked to a vendor. Uh, what Representative Kirk, Mr. Kirk, was referring to was that both Beckett and NFI have run similar type programs in other states. That's the reference. Would they bid? I'd like to think so, but no one's talked to them. Uh, and in fact, we procure services uh, of this sort through contracts. That's what our group homes are. Our group homes are at a variety of levels of intensity. And in fact, back in 2017, when we last changed this law, uh, we, uh, Representative Kirk at the time, the Chair of Finance, appropriated $9 million to make sure, because we heard many of the same arguments you're hearing today, that uh, effectively the world was going to fall apart. He appropriated $9 million, which initially was split between two providers. One being Beckett, got about $5.6 million at the time, and Nashua Children's Home uh, received the rest of it. Nashua Children's Home did not ever serve kids, um, and I won't get into the whys. They ultimately, I don't know if, their contra if they backed out of the contract or the contract was repealed, but they don't have the contract anymore. And based on public documents, that contract went to Beckett. So Beckett is receiving nearly $9 million, $8.7 million that was appropriated back in 2017 for an intensive residential program, I believe referred to as the ERP program. So this is not a foreign concept. It is, there is not an architecturally secure program in this state that I'm aware of. Primarily, I've, I've been led to believe that the department hasn't contracted for architecturally secure programs. Where I come from in Massachusetts, when I worked in adolescent care, um, architecturally secure facilities were more the norm. I, I think you can uh, understand my reluctance to have us amend this bill and rely too much on the concept of privatization when I, I don't know nearly enough about whether or not there's a, a, a market capable of responding to one. I, I, I have two business days, Monday and Tuesday. Um, how, how, how uh, uh, Mr. Kirk and Mr. DeJoy, how, how can I close that circle? How could I get confident in an amendment relying on that in just a couple of days? That's a great question, Mr. Chair. And quite candidly, I think that's why this body has policy committees to do that work. I think the policy committee has vetted the policy they have not touched the finance, and in fact, Senate finance didn't touch the finance. Um, you know, short of actually querying all the vendors in the state to ask who would provide this, which isn't going to happen before Monday or Tuesday, um, that's the way that, that we get these answers. Let, let me add something. There is another alternative. Remember, the default position now until the new facility is built is that these children will stay in the Sununu Center, okay? So put a provision in the bill that says the department will go out to bid for the private facility that will operate between the time it can start and the time that the new facility, state facility, is built and put that out to bid. Obviously, if there aren't any bids or the bids aren't acceptable, then the default position would continue. So you've got the best of both worlds there. It, it deals with the concerns, Mr. Chairman, that you've expressed, and I share them. Um, but it also allows for that possibility to go forward. Maybe these folks will bid. Maybe others will come in to bid. Maybe nobody will come in to bid. But, bid. but in the meantime, you still have your fallback position, which is the same as the one that's in the bill now. So there's no harm, no foul. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, it's great to have your experience shared with us. Appreciate it. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to say, either uh, Mr. DeJoy, Mr. Kirk? Uh, I, I can only emphasize as strongly as possible that you need some sort of figures as to the operating costs, because one of the problems with the Sununu Center is that it's a fixed cost operation. We, we're spending the same amount for 14 kids as we did for 60 kids. And 
at least if I were on the Finance Committee, I, I'd want to look to future budgets. The idea is not to lock ourselves into something that's going to be very expensive and fixed cost when, in fact, there may be another alternative. But the data is essential. Um, the department can probably come up with some back-of-the-envelope reasonable estimates, although they certainly won't be as good as they would be if they had the normal amount of time. So, so the stab that we've taken at the, in that general direction is the idea <clears throat> that possibly if the facility was co-located next to a, a facility that they could share services with, laundry, food, um, uh, maybe the warehousing and logistics uh, could maybe rely on um, uh, behavioral health specialists in an emergent situation to come help with a 2 a.m. admission, that the co-location could really cut down on the operating costs. Now, I, we don't have any numbers to back that up. That's just theory. Do you I, have a comment? I agree with you. That will uh, reduce the operating costs, but they will still be fixed. Regardless of the number of children, the operating cost of that facility will be, eight, say, $8 million a year. To the extent that it's set up for 18, which is what you folks are talking about now, and to the extent that Mr. Ribsom's uh, future projections are correct and it comes down to be six in three, four, five years, we're still stuck with that $8 million when in fact it would cost us less if these children were in a private facility and we were paying per child per day. There are risks going both ways, Mr. Chairman, and, and you may be more comfortable than I am with one particular solution, but those to me seem to be the parameters. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I, I just would want to point out that Mr. Ribson, uh, I don't think, has ever said that six is even possible, even under the best scenario, but whatever it is. Whatever it is. And then I wouldn't want to get into a debate on, you know, uh, all costs are fixed in the near term. You know, it's, it's the long term when they become variable. And so I would hope that if we went from 18 to 6, that somebody in the Division three would be smart enough to cut the budget. But uh, you never know. Let, let me answer that by saying group. that in the um, 10, 20 years that we've been doing Sununu budgets and the population has been decreasing, we've never been able to cut the costs. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Do you, do you have any final remarks, sir, Mr. DeJoy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. If it's uh, it's okay with the chair. I'd like to defer comments till next week, given the time. There are a number. There are a number of comments today that were presented as factual, which are really opinion. There are a number of misstatements today. But I would. I would end. So I'd like to be able to speak next week. But I would say that Mr. Ripsom explained to you quite succinctly why the policy committee made the decision they made to move forward in the way they did. Mr. Ripsom talked quite accurately about ramping up programs and how we effectively are going to be losing another generation of kids in Sununu. As an advocate, that's not acceptable to me. And that's part of where the policy committee came down. They did not want to lose another generation of kids. They wanted to move on this immediately. So with that, I'd... Uh, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else out there? Uh, Representative uh, Yokala? Yokala? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I am on children and family law, and so I um, would like to shed some light on what what happened there. And um, it both with HB 458 and 254, they were rushed through committee with um, very little time to announce. Um, do analysis on the policy um, with uh, 458. The it came to our committee the week before we voted on it, and we had the amendment less than an hour before we voted on it. Um, and it was a deadline day that we could not not vote on it. And so there um, there was never a discussion in the committee that um, six beds was the appropriate size. And it, I believe that um, it was the intention of the committee that it was not going to be six beds. Um, as as uh, Ripson said, it's 
impossible that it could be. Um, and I also um, expressed concern with the 254 language in the committee and not having time and not being criminal justice or judiciary to know which laws um, would be, uh, what ramifications as far as, as charging people as, as, uh, as adults. Uh, the repeat offender thing that was brought up yesterday as far as you know, smashing in cars every day uh, you know, of high school, that would be allowed um, or uh, they would never be committed or they would have to be charged in as, as an adult. Um, and if that information was, uh, you know, kids talk at school, they find out that, you know, that is, uh, that property crimes are not taken seriously, then, you know, uh, in California, if you park your car, you just expect it, the window to get broken and, and your stuff to be stolen in it. And that could um, be brought to New Hampshire. Mr. With that. Chairman, so. I think this is really verging on inappropriate characterizations. I, I would question the relevance of that right now. So, I, I am being deferential to a fellow state representative who is telling us what happened in children and family law and sharing with us what his perspective of 458 is based on the fact that they heard it in a relatively uh, abbreviated time frame. So I, 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 I have found it interesting already to pick up from his comments that uh, the implications of 254 on what it might mean to incarceration levels and that the, the, the number six versus 18 wasn't discussed very completely, that th both of those are fairly significant and uh, illuminating to me. Uh, so I, I would like to allow him to continue if that's all right. I have no problem with his characterization of his view of what went on in child and family that he's free to express his view. But when you start talking about people, you can't park your car in California without having the windows smashed. I think that's over the top. I, I, I think uh, we probably all have our own perceptions of what's happening in other states other than New Hampshire uh, based on our own narrow view of the news. And I would hope that we're all intelligent enough to filter out anything that we think needs to be filtered out from uh, Representative Yukela's observations of the news and what's going on in other states. I, 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 I think we can handle the discourse. I've had a car parked in California for the last six years and the windows haven't been broken once. I, I had a car parked in New York and the windows were broken in. So, but I never had it broken in in California. So, but go ahead, Representative Yukela, you're, you're doing great. Thank you. Uh, chairman, and um, I don't have experience from the news. I was born in California and in the Bay Area, and I lived there for many years. And I didn't say that it, parking in California, you would get your window broken. I said San Francisco, and that's much more specific. And I would never make the statement that you can't park your car in California because I parked in other parts of California and didn't get my, the window's broken, so I, I, uh, that was a little bit taken, yeah. So my, in general, my, my, uh, there was comments made earlier in this hearing that, that you guys should be stuck to the policy positions and um, that this was fully vetted by the policy and I'm saying that um, I would, I believe that is the, that uh, the committee, knew that we only had a limited amount of time and we knew that this was an important issue and so we wanted to um, to do the best that we could with the time that we had but we did not have time to fully vet it and so um, that I don't think that you should be wedded to the six six uh, um, six bed thing and there was a discussion in our committee about um, maybe not having 12 18 beds because of the necessity to um, uh, have be able to have people moved around, there was there was discussion about having um, movable walls or or movable beds, and so that you could separate people and maybe make this room bigger if if 
everyone would be able to fit, or if you had a, a wall that needed to be put up to separate people, that that might be a solution instead of having the beds be the deciding factor and maybe it would be more mobile, um, the bed capacity. Um, and so there was some fluidity as far as that. Um, it, the re one of the reasons why we thought we could come down from the, the 12 uh, or the, the 18 was that maybe if you had 12, 12 beds with movable walls, depending on how the, it was situated, maybe you would still be able to um, service the people that, that would be placed there. And so, um, yeah, so thank you. Did the committee uh, discuss the implications of sending this to interim study to buy more time to get try to get it right? Thank you for the question. Um, no, because in HB2, there's already a commitment that we're closing Sununu on the 1st of March. And um, it was believed that this that closing it without a plan was inappropriate. And so we needed a plan. Um, and that this plan was the best plan <laughs> plan that we were offered in committee. And so that's the one that we chose. And that, that I think that's uh, my perspective on that, whether or not um, the other people in the committee feel that this, maybe this was the perfect plan. I don't, but, um, I did not get that sense from the committee, and it definitely was not my my opinion in the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, yeah, my recollections is totally different this term. I've had a lot of rapid fire, a lot of rapid fire amendments. Um, this was this was discussed. It may not have been discussed as much when this amendment came, but two fifty four was discussed. The bed situation. Could, could you remind us? Are are you on? I'm on children and family. Oh, okay, thanks. I had just yeah. forgotten because every so, time I look yeah. at you, I see HHS and. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, so so it 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 was it it was discussed. Uh, is this the best? I mean, it, every time I vote yes on a on a bill and go to the floor, I never know. I I could never say in my head this is the best. Uh, because I'm going to get to the floor, somebody's going to say something, and I'm going to say, you know what, that's not a bad idea. So, um, you know, as long as producing the best, no, that, uh, however, this amendment did pass 13 to 1. So, uh, you know, I'd like to think we're all dedicated as equals. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think. I think this was a good bill. Now, if there's are there some problems that I'm reconsidering? Absolutely. The more I talk about this, I'm reconsidering. May, so. may I ask you a question? Sure. You comfortable with six instead of twelve or eighteen or some other number? Do you think six is the right number? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if we look at the House Bill 254, and uh, after listening to Mr. Ripson saying that 254 may not be the result we're looking for, and I could agree with that. He's not committed to that, but I, I could see that possibility, then um, yeah, I I don't I don't I, I'm open to six beds. I mean I'm open to what the final census after hearing all this information will bring me to what conclusion. So I'm I'm open. So so you're open. So if 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 more analysis was provided to you and it indicated that the number should be 14, 18, you're open to looking at that analysis? I'm also look, open to looking at uh, what Representative uh, Walsh uh, mentioned with a building that we currently have. Sure. I, you know, talk about savings. All right. I, so, so Mr. Ribson, if I could, if I could, if I could just reach over and, and ask you, uh, I think you've already prepared it because it was in the A and M report. Could you get an abstract together for us, uh, for specifically for Representative Long, to show uh, what kind of analysis uh, DCYF has had on on what the forecasted bed count ought to be? I think you have that data, don't you?
three years exactly how many male females are being committed. And I have that chart for the first of the first yesterday. Um, you know, but the data is still fairly small. Uh, okay, so if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you could send that to Mr. Ripple, and Mr. Ripple, if you could distribute that to the members here. Are Are you going to be back? Tuesday, Wednesday, or Monday, Tuesday, or or will somebody else be in your seat? Yeah, I know Monday I'll be here. Um, I okay. Before, before I I, I want to inform you. I, I just Monday. Okay, <laughs> all right. I I want to inform you because it, I I think no. it's a good and valid question. No. But I just yep. if we don't really vote this out until Tuesday of the subcommittee, I just don't know if the next person's going to have continuity. But but we'll worry yeah, about I, that later. I'm, thinking I'm going to be subbing through Tuesday. So. All right. Well, maybe you could ask for continuity. That would be great. Hmm. Uh, so, Representative Yukela, did we hit everything you wanted to talk about? Um, yeah. So, um, as far as 254 in committee, we did, we did talk about it. We just um, did not discuss each each crime and whether or not we thought it would it should go to, to the person should be committed or not you know if they get texting while driving should they get 15 years like we voted yesterday or should they not go to jail at all just we did not touch on any of that and so um that thank you so what i think i heard you just say is you looked at the totality of 254 as in sort of an aggregate but you didn't de-aggregate it so that you could assess an individual impact per uh, section of the law right we we had the um the goal of not putting in people that in into jail that were not violent that was the kind of overarching um, sentiment that I that I got from the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rosenberg. I think of the DRC. Mr. Chairman. The, yes. Can I just expand on the request to Mr. Ribson? Sure. Um, Mr. Ribson, we have a, a. That's okay. He doesn't have to come up. I no, just, no. I just want him to pay attention. He was. He, <laughs> um. So in addition to how many males and females are there can we know what they're in for because as the law has changed some of the things that they may have been incarcerated for in the last three years they may not be permitted to be incarcerated for today so if in the data we know why they're incarcerated that might give us better data in terms of trying to figure out um, whether those population numbers are relevant to the population that's going to arise under the current law I can tell you that there is nobody there today who was there three years ago, right? Everybody that's there today is there under current law. There are no kids there that have been there for more than a year. Sure, ago. but but you were going to give us three years worth of data, and the yes. law three years ago, I presume, was different than the law today. Haven't we narrowed what crimes they can be committed for? I think in it laws? was four or five, four or so years ago that that law changed. Okay, but can we still get an idea of how many of them are there on basically pretrial detention and how many are sentenced so we have some idea why they're there? Yeah, the data that I have has committed versus detained. So you have that. What that data does not have is what the individual charges are. At one point about a year ago, is it, I had somebody do a huge project of a hand count to figure that out. I don't have a person to do that right now, but um, I can share the data that that person gathered a year or so ago. What I would say what's misleading about that type of data is that it looks at what the charge was that they were brought in on. And oftentimes, common practice is to plea down to a lesser charge. And if you took away the ability to plea to a lesser charge, you would change the actions, potentially, of prosecutors and judges. Sure. In this no, situation. I understand that. And you would also skew the data as to why they're really there if they're sentenced. Right. right. No, I appreciate that. Well, however much you can give this committee, I'm sure it would be helpful and for us trying to, to look at these kinds of numbers. Yeah, I so can, I appreciate that. I can definitely share the data that was pulled a year ago on the charges, um, which will obviously not be as, as current. Um, I just can't get new data on that because it's it was a huge hand count project and I don't have a person. The person who used to do it left the agency and I, it's going to be hard to pull that off. You sound like every businessman in the state. I don't have enough employees. I don't have a data team. Our whole data team left for much better paying jobs. So 
it's really hard to pull some of these things together at this I'm moment. I'm sure it is, and you have my sympathy. So, so Mr. Ripson, I, I think I saw that data, and, and I think I remember a disclaimer, but I'm going to ask you to verify this, that one of the disclaimers on the charge that was listed was that had they ha a, initially, in their initial contact, if they had multiple charges, uh, the multiple charges may not show up, and that it, it gets down to just one charge when actually much more is going on. Is that, is that right? That's right. There were a lot of there were a lot of limitations in that data because DCYF isn't the charging entity, and we don't really maintain that. So we're pulling we were pulling that data from notes in in our cases, right? Which is not you know I don't know if the courts maintain a database that has that more precisely. I don't believe they do, but our our ability to get that information was very limited. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that has margaritas for us? It's well past five o'clock at this point. We thought you were providing them. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. So, I, I is this a is this a handout yours? It's called it's called the Juvenile uh, Reform Policy Group. So, I, with your indulgence, I've brought Michelle Wonger and up here with me also, if that's okay. Plenty um, of indulgence. I'm just asking, okay. is this yeah. is this your form? So, so this is. And, so, and, and if it is, the answer is yes, yeah. then I, I would ask you to please email a PDF to uh, Mr. Ripple so that we can have a digital part of our record. Because this is such a great document. We want to keep it forever. <laughs> I'd be happy to. All right. um, for the record, I'm Karen Rosenberg. I'm the Policy Director at the Disability Rights Center. And I'm here with, I'm Michelle Wangren. I'm the Youth Law Project Director at New Hampshire Legal Assistance. And our organizations, together with the um, American Civil Liberties Union of New Hampshire, New Futures, and Waypoint are um, in a collaboration, which we refer to as the Juvenile Rights um, Policy Group. And um, so I, the document I handed out really consists of principles that we have developed and in, uh, in evaluating what's the best thing for children when we're looking at replacing the Sununu Center. And one of the, and it, it, it's self-explanatory, but one of the items that I really wanna highlight that's been vetted by the Senate, by Senate Health and Human Services, by the full Senate, by Senate Finance, by the House Child and Family Law Section, and is and, and is and now is before you, is the notion of you know safety of children, and that what we believe is true is that a publicly operated facility is going to be able to afford children the safest environment, and that's for a few reasons. One is that if a facility is publicly owned, it is transparent. It is subject to our right to know law. So if there are incidents that occur, if there are lawsuits that are filed or settlements, we can secure that information, albeit without identifying information necessarily, but we will know and things cannot be swept under the rug. Um, in addition, what we know now is that our Office of the Child Advocate under our current state law has real-time access to the electronic case management database that the, the Sununu Center operates. And that's really important because it enables them to know at a moment, they will know if, is there an incident? What is the record? What led up to it? What happened? So they're at the watchdog agency that is there to help make sure that kids on a daily basis are safe. Um, they also get real time, um, they, if there is an incident, it's, it's emailed to them and they have access to the digital recordings for these children. So these are ways that we can keep kids safe and that's one of the reasons that our group really felt that a public option, a publicly operated facility is going to be the safest for kids. So I know you're, it's late, so I'll let, turn over to Michelle for a bit. Yeah, and I just want to highlight that all, all of that information was really vetted through the policy committee. And, um, and, and, I, and I just want to reiterate what, what, what Karen said, that, that we really strongly believe that the public option is the right option um, in this particular case. Um, one of the, I guess I have a few, few concerns. So we, we, one of the things I heard earlier was that, was that a private facility would be both potentially better and cheaper, it'd be more flexible and it would be cheaper. And there's this presumption that a private facility would be able to operate on a per bed basis as opposed to a fixed cost. I don't know that that's true. And I think that that's definitely something that was uh, brought up at the policy committee level as well, that if we were to retrofit a 
private a private facility facility with um, the ability to maintain a locked unit, they are not going to agree to have one child there for a you know per bed cost and not use the other space. That's just not going to happen in reality. And so that's not, you know, that that was something that one of our partners, Keith Kenning from Waypoint, made very clear at the policy level that it's just not realistic to assume that a private facility that runs a locked unit is going to operate. Um, on anything other than a fixed cost. So that's something that certainly would have to be looked at further before taking that at face value. Yep. So so would it, um, would it nevertheless be worthwhile for the state to issue an RFI so that we can go get specific answers to the issues that you raise? Or are you so convinced <laughs> in your position that you think it would be a waste of time to per pursue a request for information? I think that these are our most vulnerable children, and I believe that a public option is much safer for this particular um, population than a private facility due to the oversight by the Office of the Child Advocate. I don't want to return to a place where, this, where um, any facility, whether it's the state or a private facility, is facing the type of lawsuits that, are, that this state is facing right now. And if we put our most vulnerable children back in a facility where there's less oversight, maybe the state doesn't get sued, but the children are no better off. So one, I think that the private facility is not right for the children. Two, I don't think that we're going to get the financial the, the financial perspective that, um, that that folks are promising here. Thank you for the clarity. And another thing to keep uh, in mind. Rep Representative Weiler had, had a question. Hold on. I've read a lot of audits, 10 or 12 every year for the last 15 years. I don't have near the confidence and accountability in state operated operations as you do thank you i didn't either until the office of the child advocate came into existence and i there are many many times that i agree i disagree with the department um we <laughs> there are many occasions that we don't agree but on the safety of a private facility the way that the law is currently today with the oversight that exists currently today and the transparency that exists currently today I do have more faith in them over private facilities there was some um, testimony earlier that private facilities may be equipped to begin taking these individuals um, today um, or or upon passage of this law to have a stopgap and I think an ERT program was mentioned I work with children who have been in ERT programs they do not feel safe and in fact when when they are restrained in those facilities and act out because they are so frequently restrained those facilities say we cannot handle these children anymore and they wind up in the Sununu Center so I have no conference confidence that the facilities that are operating as ERT facilities today are going to be able to handle the the children without and and, and if and if they and if they we give them a contract to take these children and they have not changed their programming in a way that is more con conducive to a therapeutic approach what is our all our alternative so if we close the Sununu Center and we assign a contract to a private facility, which today is known for restraining children and then putting them back into the Sununu Center because they, can't, they say they can't manage them, what is the alternative? It's to send them out of state. And I think that's a very dangerous proposition that needs to be thought through very carefully before we go mm -hmm. down that path and assume that that is the right way to go. Um, I, the, the other, cons and, I, and I guess if you have any other questions uh, you, you make a very compelling argument there are advocates for privatization so so that people might be able to follow up with you uh, and and explore that on a kind of a one-to-one -one basis will you make sure that we have your contact information because i'd like to make sure that the the advocates of privatization know how to contact you absolutely all right thank you Absolutely. I mean, another thing to keep in mind is that as a state, we have decided not to privatize the way we treat people who are in our secure psychiatric unit. This session, that's a bill that's been before you. We've also decided not to privatize our prisons. And I think for similar reasons that we don't want private entities to make profits or cut corners when it comes to some really vulnerable people. Okay. okay. 
let let it uh, stipulate that you've made your argument in a complete and compelling way. What's your next point? So the the only other thing I will say, and and I know that um, the the two fifty four amendment got added on very quickly. Um, I I'd been aware of that. I had not previously been involved in in any. Um, Policy advocacy relating to 254, but I did reach out to the policy to certain members of the policy committee who I knew continued to work on on this bill um, following the committee vote. Or I guess I actually was yesterday after the House vote, and I did just raise one concern I have over that language. I think there is a few confusing parts, but overall, I think I think it gets to a good place. I think I share some of the department's concerns about unintended consequences, but my my main concern that I want to put forward is that um, the way that the law is currently written would allow only children who are convicted of felony level of offenses to go to the Sununu Center. Um, and I think you just heard from, from Director Ribsom that there are a number of children who are, um, who are charged with felony offenses who then plead to misdemeanor level offenses. Um, who, who the judge will send to the department. But if they have felony level convictions, it could lead to a number of un unintended consequences, some are which are lifelong and incredibly severe. So the one thing I would ask is that the committee consider an amendment that would allow a stopgap that if a child were to plead from a felony level of offense to a misdemeanor level of offense, and the judge expressly finds that such a plea agreement is in the child's best interest, that that be permitted in the universe of um, eligible offenses as well. And I'd be happy to share language with that. Yes, yes. And, and, and I, and I want to be clear, I think it is a very rare child that needs incarceration, a very rare child. What I would like to see the state do and the, is to continue building up the system of care in a way that ensures that no children need to be incarcerated. I, we're not there yet. The system's not built out there. Um, I, I work in the system enough um, and I've represented enough children that as much as I can argue until I'm blue in the face that a child does not need to be incarcerated, Prosecutors are not going to agree to me, probation officers are not going to agree with me, and the judge is not going to agree with me on certain children. And what I want to make sure uh, is that we have, um, that we have the ability to ch for children to be able to make choices that are in their best interest. And so if those choices are, I agree to go to the Sununu Center to avoid lifelong collateral consequences, they should be able to do that. And, um, and, and, and certainly, if Director Ribsom is right, that children are going to be either tried as adults or we're somehow going to exceed the six bed capacity, I don't want those kids going out of state. And so we need to make sure that if that's a possibility, we have a system that will absorb those children that are committed to a, a locked facility by a judge, which we do not have control over right now. Since, since you bring up the system of care and your encouragement for us to invest in it, um, in Division Three Finance uh, does the budget for the system of care. And, and I know that we put a lot of money into the program, and because we're still in that budget year, I, I don't really know what the implications of all of that investment are, but I don't think the system is built out yet. And so just so you know, one of my concerns about trusting the system of care to, to be a, 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 a more complete replacement for the Sununu Center is that it, it's, it's not in place today we have workforce issues. We, you know, there's, we, we, we don't have our own personal track record with the whole thing. So we, we might have, you know, bad actors in the system too. I, we just don't, we haven't, we haven't flushed the system to really know what, what's going on. So that, that's kind of my concern. If, 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 if you wouldn't mind, I, I'm, I looked at your document really quickly and, um, of your four priorities, uh, I don't see public safety included. It's, and uh, I, it's, it's number three. Oh, you don't uh, see no, 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 Sorry. no, no, <laughs> I no. Jumped the gun. Number Sorry. three is the safety of youth. And I love that, that that's there. I'm just pointing out that this committee, the whole legislature also has to worry about public safety 
and that doesn't seem to be one of your priorities at all. And so it just, it, 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 it's a worrisome thing if you don't think public safety is one of our priorities, because I, I think it is. So I don't want to, go ahead. To, to be clear, this document was written, assuming we need to have a facility, these are the core values of that facility which is why you don't see public safety because that's taken care of by the presumption that there needs to still be a facility because we do not have that system built out. So would you believe in the several million dollars we spent on the Alvarez and Marcel report, the, the final version of it, when it listed all of the skills and people type of people and, and issues, it completely skipped the fact that we needed the, uh, uh, sort of the jailers, that we needed fences. They completely overlooked it. And so we rejected the initial final report so that they could do an appendix to add the public security aspect. So, so, so because I'm not really in this domain all the time, it just worries me that we have community advocates that don't recognize as much as I think we ought to that public safety is a key priority. Yeah, and this presumes that it's we're talking about an architecturally secure facility that would ensure public safety and that the kids who are placed in this facility are there for multiple reasons, both because it's the least restrictive place where they can receive the treatment they need, but also to to address the needs of the public and public safety. So as Michelle was saying, that's really something that the court would have made a finding about. And this really goes to once a, once a child is at that level and requires that level of, of confinement, what should that look like? And Th thank you for that. Um, and and I, I, I'm, I'm not being critical. I'm just giving you an honest reaction, that's all. So do, are there questions for either of these two professionals? Did you have a question? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Is it accurate to say that you believe the current Sununu Center satisfies the concerns that you raise? Well, the current, no, no, it's not. <laughs> so we've we've had some some conversations with with Director Ripsom about this, where we believe that it needs to be a small, home-like, architecturally secure facility um, with clinical staff. And my understanding is that the youth counselors at the current facility. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them are still more of the correction officer mindset, as opposed to, um, as opposed to um, clinical staff that are familiar with adolescent brain science and the needs of this specific population of youth. And it, and and, and, to, and to your to your point, Representative Edwards, I, I I understand the the need to have jailers, if you will. But when we are working with a youth population that is very much, um, I, I guess most of them have disabilities. Um, many of them have post-traumatic stress disorder. Many of them come from abusive homes. And so the mindset for that population of youth needs to be much different. For the PTSD kids, if you, if, if, if you approach them too quickly in a you know, in a, in a correction officer mindset, they're going to react, and that's just part of their disability. And they're going to get into a tussle, they're going to get into a fight, and it's going to become a very unsafe situation, both for the child and for the correction officer, which is why it is so important to have a new model that incorporates evidence-based practices and relies upon um, trained staff, or staff who are trained to work with this very specific population of youth. In com from conversations with Director Ripsom, I think we are moving there. I don't think we're there yet, um, but but the language in this bill says that we will continue mo moving forward there today with an end date of, I think, March 2023, um, so that that model will be ready to go in the new facility. So is it necessary to build a new facility to accomplish the goal that you just described? Well, it is because the facility that we're currently operating is not home-like. It's not a therapeutic environment. It really does feel like a jail. I, I don't know if you've been in there and gone, but it's, yeah, it, it feels like a correctional facility. It's also way too big and it's really expensive. And that's something that you all do care about, right? It's on a huge campus that needs to be maintained and a very much larger facility than we need. But just addressing the facility, not the campus. 
it's it, it's not appropriate because it is more like a jail than a than a therapeutic facility and I, I, what i what you know but we need something between now and june of 2024 right so it what i understand is that in, at this juncture um that we are putting into pl they are putting into place evidence-based programs they are working on getting staff that are qualified they are contracting with dartmouth for psychiatric services and that what is required in this bill is that these all the programmatic supports and requirements be put into place by march of 2023 so, so just to reassure you the the legislature has totally bought off on the idea that we need to go to a therapeutic model and that we're transitioning from a correctional officer mentality the backstop to that is you know you still got to keep the kids in 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 the facility and not escape so I, yeah. I but, yep. yeah all right so um any questions all right i just have Go a quick Go question ahead. there was a presumption here that we have to build a facility are you comfortable with rehabbing a building and not just starting from scratch we don't have to build from the ground up Sure. I mean, I, I don't think that's up to us because we're not construction people, but as long as it meets all of these criteria and then that's fine. Okay. Well, so you said build a new one. That's why I just wanted well, to clarify. I, I have no opinion on how yeah. it's built. Right. Okay. Thank I guess you. It could be, it could be rehabilitated. It could be new construction. Um, but you know, it just needs to meet the, the residents needs. All right. Uh, so we're rapidly approaching 6 p.m. This has been a really informative session. Uh, Senator Daniels, out of deference to you, you've, you've sat through this for nearly two hours. Do you have any comments or questions you'd like to ask for you or that you'd like to ask yourself? <laughs> Good idea. Did you have another? I do, Mr. Chairman. I, I just I just want to make a comment. And, and, you know, I started in 2004 on the Children and Family Law Committee. I have really made an awful lot of these kinds of issues the focus of my career here. And I want to keep people in mind. There, there's sort of a an underlying current here with some people that it seems like they're thinking more like adults. We are not talking about adults here. We're talking about children that have different mental developments, different issues. I know from all the work I've done that it, the number used to be, and I suspect it's not much different now, 80% of the kids at the Sununu Center have, are on IEPs. They have some sort of learning disability issue. And many of those kids, as was testified to before, don't have the supports at home. So we've got kids that are coming in you know, really without the supports that, that the kids outside the Sununu Center or outside other facilities have had. Um, I also want to point out to those that have not done this work for so long that this is the nationwide trend. And Missouri was the first state to do this where they basically closed all their big institutions and put everybody into these smaller home-like settings. And um, New York City did the same thing. And about 10 years ago or so, I can't remember the exact year, when I was chair of Children and Family Law, NCSL sent me to New York to a really interesting conference. There were about 40 of us from around the country and this chair of children and family, I was sent there. And we actually got to go into one of these facilities in Brooklyn and see how it operates. And I think there were six or eight kids in there, including live-in therapists. It's fascinating to see how it works and how successful it is. But they were all focused on the fact that these are children we're talking about and the services provided were focused on children. And here, it's real easy for people who have not heard all that testimony that I've heard over the years or seen those kinds of facilities to think about having to lock these kids up the same way we think about locking up adults. And these are broken humans that are broken as children. And I wanna keep in mind that what is appropriate for adults and the way we need to lock up adults is not the way we need to lock the kids up. We certainly need to lock some of them up or to keep them in secure units because they will hurt members of the public. But I don't want anybody here to lose sight of the fact that we are talking about locking up children and it is done differently. It has different effects and, and the approach should be very different than the way approach we take with adults. So I know that's a little lecture, but it comes from the heart and I needed to say it. Sure. I'm, I'm glad you did. I, and I'll, I'll just share with you that when I came off active duty in the army in 1991, my wife and I were approved to be uh, house parents at Boystown university in Omaha. 
And then after some calculation of what we needed for our family, we just couldn't afford it. So, so I love the Boys Town model, and I wish Boys Town would come to New Hampshire. So, um, and then um, she and I both went through foster training, and so we understand that these kids are different. And I think Division Three, you you haven't you didn't spend last budget year with us, but I. I, I would like to think that while we were assigning resources, we were doing it from a compassionate therapeutic perspective. We, we did not undercut any direct health care activities, for example. At this point, I think everyone's had their opportunity to say something, and they're just done. So uh, I will uh, adj adjourn today's work session with the expectation that, that we may have something that looks like an amendment on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, but whatever we do, it's got to be done by Tuesday night so that uh, the full finance committee can vote on it Wednesday. All right. Thank you. We're adjourned.